Good morning, everyone. My name is Teresa Thomas. I am the Executive Director with the Bluegrass Council of the Blind. And on behalf of the planning committee that has put together the 2020 Eye Open Symposium, I wanted to welcome our participants. We had over 120 participants register for this event today, and we're extremely pleased with um, all of you that are joining us early this morning. We want to recognize the planning committee, uh, the different agencies and uh, individuals that are represented. We have um, on the screen, we're going to list all of the people that served on this committee from places like the Lexington Fayette Urban County Government Agency on Aging, the VA Blind Services. We have people from the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation Blind Services, Bluegrass Care Navigators, the Bluegrass Council of the Blind. Um, many different agencies came together along with some individuals, some community volunteers that helped us out with this event. We hope that you enjoy and learn a lot today. And uh, we also wanted to thank our sponsors. We have three sponsors. I believe it's uh, Vanda Pharmaceuticals and United Healthcare and KAER. Welcome to everyone. And we hope you enjoy our presentations today. And I'll turn it back over to Diana Doggett with the Fayette County Extension Office, who was also a very key part of our planning committee. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Teresa. Well, this is a great day. We've all looked forward to. And um, so I'm just so anxious to see and hear everything that uh, will be presented. Um, I want to remind you that the Eye Opening Symposium is hosted in Zoom webinar. And that means that participants, let me just change my screen here. Participants in the webinar can hear and see presenters. So attendees are not active on mics or cameras. So if you choose to participate in the chat box, your name will be public to the group. And our EOS presenters will participate in Q&A at the conclusion of their presentation. Attendees will use the chat box to state their questions. So I would, uh, it's a good idea as you uh, are listening to just go ahead and type your question in. Um, when it, when it occurs to you, and we will be looking at those at the conclusion and present them to the speakers. I do want to remind you to keep uh, uh, all of our engagement in the chat box positive. Agenda. Agenda. <clears throat> okay, you are viewing the 2020 Eye Opening Symposium Agenda. So here it is, and several participants have applied for continuing units RCEUs today. And in order to qualify for the 4.5 hours of CEUs, A, C, B, R, E, P, you must attend the entire symposium. Partial credits cannot be awarded. So since this is a virtual event, our CEU governing bodies need assurance that participants were actually present for each of the speakers' presentations. All of the speakers have been given CEU code words that they will incorporate into their presentations. Each speaker will say the code word is, so listen closely to that and please document each speaker and their code word as this information will be needed to complete your evaluation. These code words will only be presented by the speakers and will not be stated during the breaks or during lunch. Our first session is entitled The State of Genetic Diagnosis and Therapy in 2020. And our speaker is Dr. Ramirez Maldonado. And he is from the University of Kentucky Ophthalmology specializing in ophthalmic genetics and retinal diseases. He treats patients of all ages with retinal diseases of any kind. His research interests focused on conditions such as retinitis pigmentosa, which causes severe 
vision impairment, and Stargardt disease, the most common form of inherited juvenile macular degeneration. His work involves genetic testing and counseling to give patients a comprehensive analysis of inheritance patterns that can help in determining the chances of passing on certain diseases and conditions to their children. Welcome, Dr. Mal Malinato. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor to be here. I um, really appreciate the invitation to uh, participate. Uh, my name is uh, Ramiro Maldonado. I am a, a retina specialist, uh, but I am also a, a ophthalmic geneticist. Uh, so uh, my specialty is to see um, inherited eye diseases. Uh, and um, in addition to that, I see macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, all those uh, diseases that affect the back of the eye. But in particular, uh, today I'm going to, to talk about the genetics basic uh, part of these diseases. All of these uh, uh, retinal diseases, they have a genetic component. So you may uh, have met many people with macular degeneration that have um, several family members affected by the disease. And uh, they may be wondering, um, why is uh, my family having all those members with macular degeneration? What is the, the genetic problem? So um, let me talk about this because I think that uh, I just wanted to uh, show some questions to, to the audience and, and answer them uh, in, uh, in an effort to convey most of the uh, important um, questions that people usually have. So um, since we're going to talk about the genetic diseases, inherited diseases, one of the first questions that everybody may be asking is, uh, do I need to get genetic testing? And what is genetic testing in, in, in general? And so um, what I like to tell my patients is that um, the DNA uh, is basically the instruction book. Um, that each of us have in every cell. Every cell has this manual with all the instructions. And uh, technology has advanced so much that we are now able to read, uh, read completely that instruction book. Um, and uh, so that is precisely genetic testing, uh, going and looking at the DNA, at all the sequence of letters, um, to be able to, to know where is the problem, why is the cell not working well, and why that cell uh, malfunction is causing disease. So genetic testing essentially is looking at the DNA, at the instruction book to look for those typos. That's what I uh, like to tell my patients. And so genetic testing, it's not only DNA testing. I mean, there are other forms that are considered under this uh, group of, uh, of genetic testing. So one is DNA testing that I was talking to you about, looking at the DNA. Uh, other tests, uh, they look at the chromosomes. And as you may know, the chromosomes are... Um, uh, tiny little structures that we can see with microscopes inside of the cells. And uh, we can, uh, we are supposed to have 23 pairs. Every uh, human being has to have 23 pairs on each cell. And so when we check at the chromosomes, in, uh, we can see if there are missing chromosomes or extra chromosomes, or some chromosomes are missing some portions, some parts. And all that information can lead us into a diagnosis. We can also do uh, RNA analysis. And I don't want to make this uh, too complex. RNA is just the next step in the DNA processing. And um, analyzing that uh, RNA uh, processing, it's important because there are some diseases where the DNA is completely fine. But the next step in the processing of the DNA 
the RNA has some um, errors. And so we can check that portion of, of the chain. But we can also uh, check if the genes are expressing well. So the genes are um, the um, currency, the coin of inheritance. So we pass genes along and so to the next generation. So genes are essentially uh, like units of DNA and those units of DNA are essentially going to produce proteins. And so we can check also if the gene is working well and if the, how much protein is that gene making. So all those things can be done in genetic testing um, for the diagnosis of our patients. So many people may be asking, uh, how is genetic testing done? If patients need to provide a blood sample so we can process the blood, uh, extract only the white blood cells, then uh, get the DNA from, from there. Um, but um, nowadays, most of the genetic testing is just done with a saliva sample. So that is extremely convenient uh, in, uh, in clinics. Uh, nowadays, you know, patients, they uh, are afraid of, of the, the blood sample and especially uh, children or teenagers. So it's super simple to just get them to spit a little bit of saliva in one, two, and we process the genetic testing uh, from there. And so um, it is also very convenient for offices. I don't have to send the patient to the lab to get the blood drawn uh, or have a nurse there to, to um, be collecting the samples. We can just collect the saliva sample there. It is a very interesting that in some cases, for example, we do the genetic testing in a patient and we discover that that patient has a DNA change, a mutation in one gene that comes directly from the parents. And we want to test the parents as well, but then we often get these uh, comments. The patient tells us, oh, my parents are in California. The, uh, other side of the country, they, they cannot come here. We have the capability to send the testing kits to the patient's home. And so it's very convenient. It's, it's a kit that comes with all the instructions. They just have to collect the saliva sample, uh, put it in the ship, uh, in, the, in the kit. And it comes with all the shipping materials and everything. And, and so we can run genetic testing remotely for families, you know, in these uh, diseases, it's um, quite important to test family members in a good percentage of situations. And um, so th this is a, a little drawing, uh, basically the uh, uh, pink circle that you see there, it's, it's a cell and the purple area, as you know, is the nucleus of the cell. And inside the, that nucleus, you can see uh, those um, black uh, X-like uh, structures. Those are the chromosomes that we were talking about. And so if we magnify them, uh, we can uh, see that if we unfold them, it's basically when we are unfold the chromosomes, we can see the DNA. The DNA you can think of as a, a, as a very, very long chain that has been wrapped and uh, to form the chromosomes and to be tightly packed inside the cell of the nucleus. So with, uh, when we get the cells from the saliva or from the blood, we do a process to unfold this DNA so we can uh, analyze it. And this is what we get. Essentially, the genetic code, it is a, a huge uh, sequence of letters, uh, three billion letters. And of course, we don't call it letters in, uh, in genetics, we call it uh, um, nucleotides. And so, uh, there are four types of nucleotides and, and the combination of them uh, makes the uh, genetic code. But yeah, there are three billion of letters. So analyzing the entire DNA, it is um, quite complicated. 
And so, uh, before I say this, um, there are different types of looking at these uh, billion of letters. Uh, the most uh, convenient, if we can say, is to analyze panels. So, uh, for example, for eye diseases, we know uh, or we are familiar with um, around 300 genes that can cause eye diseases. And so we know that those genes cause specific eye diseases. And um, when we are, have a patient with an inherited eye disease, we are going to look at those segments as, as those genes only uh, to simplify the look for this, right? And so because we have a high uh, probability of finding the, the result, if we only look at those genes specific for eye diseases, um, a cardiologist may request a cardiology panel. And so in that test, we will be looking only at genes that cause uh, cardiac heart problems. And so this is a way to, uh, to, to look at these billion of letters uh, in a more efficient way. So that's uh, called panel testing. So we look at the specific segments that we, we know cause the specific disease that we are looking for. Now, many times we don't find the answer there and then we have to look at the remaining of the DNA and so uh, then we have other steps. If the panel fails, we have other steps uh, that are best known as whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing. But essentially in a nutshell, that is looking at the rest of the, of the letters outside of the, of the gene panel. Another question that patients uh, frequently ask is, will I learn everything about my health with genetic testing? And uh, I wanna emphasize uh, on the previous concept. Uh, what we uh, do is we target our approach when we are doing genetic testing. So um, if you have an eye disease and you're getting genetic testing, uh, the most likely test that you're going to get is a gene panel. And that gene panel is going to look only for genes that cause eye problems. So um, if you get that, you're not going to get the analysis of genes that could cause uh, breast cancer, for example. Um, and so um, this is a myth that uh, people uh, have uh, because in, at the beginning of the genetic testing era, we were looking at the entire DNA. So people that went with an eye disease could potentially um, have uh, a result that they were not expecting, you know, um, a gene that caused uh, a, a certain cancer in the family, and that was a devastating uh, uh, news, uh, they were going for a, um, a diagnosis of an eye disease and they found something that they were not expecting to find and perhaps they didn't want to find out. And so that is not the case anymore when you get genetic testing, you are being tested for genes that cause the specific problem that you are inquiring about. So uh, that is important to um, emphasize. So now you know that you're going to be tested for the specific genes that can cause your, your, your eye problem or your, any other problem that you're asking about. But what can you learn about genetic, from genetic testing? I mean, uh, is it important to get genetic testing? And uh, there are four advantages of uh, genetic testing. Number one is a precise diagnosis. In particular, in my clinic, I get uh, many referrals of uh, patients with um, retinitis pigmentosa. And they have been carrying this diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa for many years. And when I do the evaluation, I don't look only at the eyes, I look at the rest of the body. I, we, we look at the family history we look at the development of the patient. And very frequently, 
we discover other clues that are very important. And so with all that information and genetic testing, we many times come with very um, uh, interesting diagnosis. So patients that have been uh, told to have just retinitis pigmentosa, they find uh, after our evaluation and after genetic testing that they have Bardet beetle, for example. That is a syndrome that has retinitis pigmentosa, but also they have um, endocrine or hormonal imbalances. And, um, and now that they know this, the patients can be counseled and the, the primary care physician can be advised that the patient has this syndrome so the patient can be better served. And now the patient understand why uh, that patient has been obese all their life since uh, childhood. And you know, and they have been going in diets and uh, feeling bad about their obesity problem and uh, struggling with other health conditions because they didn't know the diagnosis. So the list of these cases is tremendous. You know, we have patients that come with eye diseases that we are able to tell them that they have a, a syndrome that sometimes affects the kidneys. And thanks to this precise diagnosis, now they can have a, a more formal evaluation of the kidneys and discover uh, kidney problems at early stage and be treated at early stage and prevent kidney damage. So um, genetic testing has made our diagnosis tremendously accurate. So you can finally get a precise diagnosis with genetic testing. A second advantage of genetic testing is the inheritance pattern. Many patients are wondering why they got this disease. So with genetic testing, we're able to tell you if you got this disease from, from mom or from dad, uh, and um, what are the chances that your children can have this disease? Um, and so this is very important information for patients, you know, sometimes they know that these ha they have this degenerative disease, uh, but knowing that their kids are not going to have it, it's tremendous good news for them. So um, knowing the inheritance pattern is also something that we can do uh, from genetic testing. Um, the advantage number three is the prognosis. Once we know the type of gene, we can tell you a little bit more about the prognosis. For example, in the case of retinitis pigmentosa, uh, there are some genes that go faster than others. So if we see the gene, we can tell the patient uh, how fast their disease is going to go. And that of course helps them to plan their lives. Um, and uh, I would like to say, um, I would like to say also that um, another advantage is treatment options. So um, the difference between today and five years ago is that we have clinical trials, we have uh, treatment options um, available for these patients and um, and we would like to offer them. So if you don't know your genetic uh, testing information, you may not know that you qualify for a clinical trial or that there is a treatment option in the form of gene therapy. And even if there is nothing at the moment, at least you will be in the front of the line um, uh, for to be considered for these uh, options. Um, so, Genetic testing is very important. These are the four uh, advantages of getting genetic testing. Another question is, is genetic testing expensive? And uh, I would like to say that it was extremely expensive, uh, but the price is coming down. Um, 
insurance companies are becoming more familiar with genetic testing, with the indications and with the advantages of genetic testing. So insurance companies are progressively getting better at covering genetic testing. Um, they are still um, um, a little bit reluctant of uh, paying uh, expensive, uh, the most expensive uh, types of genetic testing, but they are getting better at paying uh, at least uh, panels of genetic testing. As you remember, that was the first step in genetic testing. So uh, also the price of genetic testing is coming down. So it used to be like around two two thousand dollars. Now uh, for a comprehensive panel, it's um, one thousand two hundred uh, dollars. So the price is coming down. And for other type of diseases, you can find um, some panels um, at the price of five hundred dollars. So the price is coming down. Now, not every genetic testing is the same. Not every lab is doing the same work. Uh, so this is, not, this is not like a blood sugar test where um, you can go to any lab and get the same uh, result, the same procedure. Um, a, a genetic testing uh, is done differently at different labs. Uh, so, um, it's important that you have a doctor familiar with genetic testing to order this, because you can have an eye panel in one lab that only checks at 35 genes versus, for example, the panel that we do here that it checks 350 genes. So it is a big difference. So genetic testing, the price is coming down, insurances are helping more. Um, it, it, not every genetic testing is the same. And so um, you gotta have some uh, guidance regarding that before doing genetic testing. And I would like to mention also that here at the University of Kentucky um, in the eye department, we do genetic testing under a research protocol. We have the sponsorship of the Foundation for Fighting Blindness under the My Retina Tracker program. And so genetic testing uh, is um, free for our patients. Uh, so that is a tremendous help to advance in research and to serve our patients in a better way. So at least our patients in the eye, eye genetics department, they don't have to worry about this. Can I lose my insurance uh, or job if I get genetic testing? Um, the short answer is uh, no. Um, you may be familiar with the genetic information uh, non-discriminatory um, GINA. So um, this act was signed in 2008 and the purpose is to protect uh, individuals from discrimination from insurers and employers. Um, so um, you cannot lose your job, you cannot lose insurance, medical insurance because of your genetic testing results. So many patients were afraid about that and that's why they didn't want to get genetic testing. Uh, this is not the case. Um, unfortunately, this act does not apply to very small uh, companies. Like uh, if, if you work in a company that has less than 15 employees, this act may, may not apply. Um, and, um, and also it doesn't apply for um, in, in other types of insurances uh, like um, in life insurance, for example. This act does not apply there, but at least uh, for job purposes or for uh, medical or uh, health insurance, uh, you don't have to worry about that. You cannot lose your job or you cannot be denied uh, health insurance based on the results of your genetic testing. Another worry about patient, from patients is, will genetic testing labs sell my genetic information? And uh, uh, short answer is no. 
uh, the genetic uh, laboratories, they uh, can share your de-identified information, yes, uh, but nothing that links you to that information. So uh, they can sell that to, for example, pharmaceutical companies. Uh, but what they sell is a big chunks of uh, DNA uh, of DNA information. So, for example, they have identified 100 of pa uh, patients with this specific gene, and so they can sell the information in a group. You know, uh, from these 100 patients with this gene, uh, the majority has this type of mutation. So the company. Uh, wants to know that because they would like to target a therapy towards that portion of uh, for uh, of the mutations um, to make you know their uh, business more effective. You know they can target the therapy that is going to affect uh, more patients. So I'm almost done here. Um, and what is the status of gene therapy? So I just want to close this uh, uh, lecture talking a little bit about gene therapy. Uh, I want to emphasize the concept that gene therapy comes in different flavors. Um, and gene therapy is a reality. It was a pure fiction years ago and now it's a reality. Um, in a, in a little summary, it's basically taking a portion of DNA, putting the, this portion of the DNA uh, inside a virus, injecting that virus, and uh, that virus has the correct copy of the gene, and that uh, virus goes inside the cells, the cells eat, that virus and uh, now incorporate the DNA inside their cells. Um, so with this, uh, this is the most common form of uh, gene therapy, but there are other types of gene therapy that uh, go beyond the, the scope of this lecture. I would like to emphasize that, uh, to share with you, um, my friends, uh, the good news that in September 2020, just uh, recently, a few weeks ago, uh, we had the first patient uh, treated in Kentucky with gene therapy for a blinding disorder. Uh, so this is something that we want to share because it's a tremendous um, achievement for us. Uh, we have been working in the genetics, uh, iGenetics service for the last uh, two years, uh, trying to get to this point. We wanted to be able to offer our patients uh, some solutions uh, for these devastating disorders. And it has been a lot of work. It has been uh, from setting up the genetic diagnosis uh, platform to getting all the equipment that is needed for these. And it has been a tremendous investment and we're still in need of more equipment and we keep uh, uh, working with, um, um, with the university to, um, to get more equipment that is necessary for this. But this is a great achievement. Our patient is doing very well. Uh, he has retinitis pigmentosa, a degenerative condition. He knows that if we don't do anything, he's going to go blind. So, um, uh, he ha he's doing very well. The study lasts for one year. We do the gene therapy in uh, one eye and the other eye serves as a control. And so we are very much looking forward to the, to the results of this study. But at the same time, we are opening a window for other gene therapies for other eye diseases. So stay tuned, please. I don't want to take more time. Uh, um, I want to thank you very much for this chance uh, to share our experience. And uh, I will be happy to take any questions right now, but also my contact information is there. My first name is uh, Ramiro and last name Maldonado. So my first name dot my last name at uky.edu. And also we have a recently launched a website. It's called iGenetics, 
dot ukhc dot org. In that website, you will find information about our clinical trials, about our clinic, how to contact us, some research opportunities and some educational opportunities also for physicians and for technicians. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. And um, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Malinato. This has been so um, fascinating and encouraging and enlightening uh, to hear all the advances in gene therapy. We read about it, we know that um, it's, the, it's, it's the way of the future and how exciting to think that we have this patient in Kentucky. Um, and we'll look forward to, to hearing um, about that progress. So this is a time if you have a question that you would like to ask, go to the chat box. And this is chat here, are there any known side effects of genetic therapies? Uh, yes, of course, as any, any uh, therapies, uh, there are always side effects. Uh, and so um, the question is very broad because as I was saying, um, there are different uh, gene therapies. There are like five different uh, gene therapies and they are specific to the organ or the disease that you're treating. So for example, in the eye, the side effects are minimal. Um, uh, we Just have seen that it causes um, sure. uh, some swelling in the back of the eye that it's minimal and goes away with uh, eye drops. Um, so, but again, the, the side effects are specific to each therapy and to the organ that you're treating. So uh, another question is asking me about what disease the patient who had gene therapy uh, had, uh, the patient that we treated had, uh, has retinitis pigmentosa. If a patient has a full benefits of genetic testing, do they ask for a comprehensive test or what should they ask for? Because insurance only pays for one per lifetime, correct? I would say that the decision of what type of genetic testing you get has to be done in conjunction with a, a physician familiar with genetic testing. So, um, in, for example, in my case, uh, depending on um, what I see, if the examination is completely consistent with one specific disease, for example, best disease, it's a disease that affects the macula, I get, uh, I just test the best one gene. Uh, if I have another patient that I am thinking of a syndrome, I test the specific gene for that syndrome. If I am seeing a disease, a retinitis pigmentosa that looks a little bit unusual, I can get a panel. If that panel is negative, I can get a whole exome sequencing. So the, the indication has to be uh, done by a doctor in conjunction with the patient, yeah. Any other okay. It has been in the scope of uh, treatments for a long, long time. Uh, it is a disease that has a lot of attention from the research community. It is uh, falling behind in, uh, in, in terms of gen, uh, gene therapy um, because the gene that causes Stargardt's disease is uh, very large and it's difficult to um, to encapsulate the gene inside the virus. And it's, so it's difficult to inject it and deliver it. So um, 
stay tuned. Um, it, it can be addressed, but it's, it's going to take some years before we can do gene therapy for stargers. Okay, are, is there, are there any more questions? And I do want to mention that the code word for this presentation is squash. The well, it seems is like there are no more questions. Thank you so much again for uh, your attention and I um, uh, hope you enjoyed the rest of the meeting. Thank you so much for just very, very important and um, revolutionary information. We just thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Malinato. Thank you. Okay, and, and I do want to emphasize one more time that the code word for this first presentation on gene therapy is squash, code word squash. Okay, Christy, we'll turn it over to you. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Maldonado. I have to tell you, he was the fastest in returning all of his paperwork as we were organizing. So it is my pleasure to introduce you to Justin Alves and Kathy Holder. Kathy Holder is with United Healthcare and she is one of our gold sponsors. And together they're gonna to talk about a program that's being offered that might be of interest to everybody's um, clients. Kathy, welcome. Thank you, Christy. Um, like Christy said, I'm the manager of community outreach for United Healthcare here in Lexington, and we certainly appreciate the opportunity to sponsor a worthy and informative event like this. So uh, thanks, Christy, and to the Bluegrass Council of the Blind for allowing us to sponsor this. Um, what I do uh, is we go out and sponsor events out in the community uh, with a focus on assisting individuals um, with disabilities and aging, and we cater to the social determinants of health, such as food insecurity, housing, disability, and those types of things. Our mission is to connect with persons to make sure they have quality health care with an emphasis on wellness and prevention. In 2021, we will become a Medicaid provider for the state of Kentucky, so we're very excited about that. Um, I want to introduce Justin Alves. Uh, Justin is a representative of United Healthcare, uh, very um, informative and uh, has a lot of information to share with you. We have a specific plan uh, that uh, for those with individuals with disabilities, it's called the dual special plan, uh, I'm sorry, dual special needs plan. And Justin is gonna highlight some of the benefits of that plan. If anyone wants to reach us out after the, um, this event, you can reach us through the Bluegrass Council of the Blind. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Justin. Thanks, Justin. Hi, everybody. Uh, hope everybody's doing well this morning. So as Kathy was saying is, I'm gonna go over some of the benefits of the United Healthcare Dual Complete uh, Special Needs Plan. And so basically what that means is for uh, beneficiaries that have Medicare, and qualifying levels of Medicaid, uh, this plan is eligible uh, for you to enroll in. And what it does is it uh, is a Medicare Advantage plan. Um, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with those, but again, you can reach out to us if you want a little bit more clarification or anything on how everything works there. But these plans um, give you a lot of extra benefits for qualifying for them. So in general, uh, I'm going to go over the benefits for a full, a fully eligible uh, member because there are a couple uh, little things here or there depending on your level of eligibility. So the first great thing about this plan is there's no monthly premium. So if you qualify for it, it's a zero dollar monthly premium. You don't have to worry about paying that out of pocket. Your doctor's office visits are also all going to be zero dollars, um, and they actually include tele. Uh, telehealth or telemedicine video uh, medical visits are included in that. And that's for, you know, like your standard doctors or um, your mental health uh, appointments. So for therapies and stuff like that. Preventative services, of course, are covered. Inpatient hospital, outpatient hospital, everything there is zero. Um, and so the, the general rule is most things are going to be zero if you're fully eligible for the plan. 
um, and that includes emergency care, lab services, everything like that. The most exciting thing about these plans are going to be the extra benefits. So, of course, a lot of the medical stuff is covered, but, of course, the extra benefits are really where um, the member themselves uh, get the most. So, you're going to have vision coverage. So, you get a routine vision exam every year at no charge, and you get $250 for lenses, frames, and contacts. So, it's something that you can use, you know, towards if, you know, you're uh, able to use glasses, um, you get $250 to go towards those. Dental is also going to be included. So all of your preventative care is covered at no copay. That's exams, cleanings, x-rays, fluoride, all of that. And there's no charge for comprehensive dental services covered by the plan. Now, there are certain limits built in for that. Um, there is a $2,500 limit on all dental services. So $2,500 is quite a bit of money uh, to go towards dental, and it's one of the highest uh, allowances that they give um, on these types of plans. Hearing is also covered. So it's, again, $0 copay for a routine hearing exam. And then for hearing aids, you actually get a $2,000 allowance for up to two hearing aids every two years. So they're going to help pay uh, towards that. They're not giving you a copay. They're not making you pay full cost. You're getting a $2,000 allowance to go towards that, which uh, is quite a bit uh, of, of money there. A couple other extra benefits are going to be uh, the Renew Active program. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Silver Sneakers. It's very similar. It's a gym membership, um, and the, uh, the footprint is about the same. It's just a different name. Because uh, it's done by United Healthcare, um, so it's Renew Active, and that's a free fitness membership. So the YMCA is in um, Planet Fitness, uh, LA Fitness. A lot of your uh, big chain gyms are going to be in there as well. So that's something we can always look up if you need any help, uh, as far as what gyms are in the network if you have one in mind. There's also classes, online courses, brain exercises that you can do through that Renew Active program, as well as um, they can send you a kit to do exercise at home if needed. Transportation is also going to be an included benefit. They'll give you 48 one-way trips per year to and from approved location. So that's going to be like the pharmacy, the doctor's office, stuff like that. And so... Uh, 48 one-way trips. You just have to give them a call a few days ahead of time. Just to give them give the vendor a heads up that you're going to need need a ride. A personal emergency response system is also included. So that's going to be um, I'm sure everybody's seen the I've fallen and can't get up type of systems. It's it's similar to that. It's actually they've gotten a little bit more advanced now, and one of those is going to be included at no additional cost. Um, and they have like the bracelets and necklaces and stuff like that. So those are also included. You also get some routine chiropractic care. That's something kind of new for this year because mostly Medicare is only going to cover subluxation of the spine. So it's manipulation of that of the spine for certain things. Uh, but United Healthcare is going to throw in 12 visits per year of just routine chiropractic care. A couple other really exciting ones. So there's an over-the-counter uh, benefit where they'll basically give you a card that you can use online, over the phone, or in certain retail locations. And they give you $265 per quarter to go towards over-the-counter items. So there's a lot of stuff that's actually included in that. Of course, they have a uh, catalog that you could uh, uh, search through. They're especially marked things at most of the retail uh, locations. A lot of the time, it's going to be the generic version, not the name brand of certain uh, products, but of course they work just as well. And you're gonna have stuff in that catalog that's gonna get along the lines of vitamins. You'll have um, ibuprofen, Band-Aids, uh, certain supportive devices, a little bit of everything's gonna be in there. And that $265 will uh, go over to the next quarter if you don't use it all. But if it's not used by the end of the year, anything left over will go away. So if everybody needs Band-Aids for Christmas, get, use that money. Hey, um, Justin and Kathy, yes. 
we're about out of time and need to give people a chance to fill up their coffee and relieve themselves before our next speaker. Okay. Um, thank you so much. And we sent in the packet of information, and I think everybody that's attending also got the one-page flyer that um, United Healthcare provided. So Perfect. if you just want to um, provide in the chat box a way to get in touch with you directly, if that's how you and Kathy want to work it, that would be great. Everybody that's on with us, thank you so much. Take a really quick break, and we'll be back with Justin at 10.03. Thanks so much. <laughs> And while you're getting your coffee, <laughs> uh, I wanted to take a moment to introduce the Blind Services Coalition of Kentucky and some of our participating vendors. So if you just give me a second, where is it? Ah, ha, ha, here we go. Okay. Uh, founded in 2013, the Blind Services Coalition of Kentucky has over 20 member organizations serving individuals with low to no vision across the entire Commonwealth. The coalition has been an advocate for Kentuckians with vision loss and has requested each governor for the past seven years to proclaim October as Blindness and Visual Impairment Aware Awareness Month, which they have honored. Visually Impaired Preschool Services empowers families by providing educational excellence to young children with visual impairments in order to build a strong foundation for reaching their highest potential. VIPS is the only agency that provides early intervention and educational programming to children birth to five who are blind and visually impaired residing in Kentucky and Indiana. VIPS is also proud to be one of the founding members of the Blind Services Coalition of Kentucky. Another founding member of the coalition is Radio I. Radio I broadcasts the reading of current news, public service, and general interest programming to people who are blind and print disabled with the vision of producing quality programming designed to help their listening audience lead enriched, productive, and independent lives. Bluegrass Care Navigators, formerly known as Hospice of the Bluegrass. Whatever challenges you face with a serious illness, Bluegrass Care Navigators guides and provides the right care to improve comfort, quality of life, and peace of mind. Right, we are back for our second session. And um, the title of this session is What You Need to Know About Orientation and Mobility, and will be presented by Do Dr. Justin Kayser. Dr. Kayser is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Kentucky. He teaches in a program to prepare orientation and mobility specialists and teachers of students with visual impairments. His recent research has focused on functional vision assessments and O&M assessments. He has presented at numerous national and regional conferences. Welcome, Dr. Kayser. Thank you. Okay, so let me get my presentation. Okay, so I am just gonna try and focus on the key parts related to orientation mobility, but I think I still have a lot of information in this presentation. So again, I'm from the University of Kentucky. Your code word for continuing education is spinach, S-P-I-N-A-C-H. And I'll, Try to remember to repeat that at the end. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about what O&M is, why it's important, a little bit about skills and techniques, although I think that's going to be challenging. Um, and I know they are talking about some skills and techniques after this too. So 
probably talk a little bit about legislation related to O&M and some different resources that are out there. So what is O&M? Understanding the distance and direction of things around you. So maintaining your awareness of that environment as it changes or as you even move through that environment. And then the mobility part is actually how you move through that environment and just kind of putting those two concepts together. And what we're trying to do is to give someone the skills to go to familiar and unfamiliar environments. Unfamiliar tends to be one of those big challenges in O&M. Um, and helping people to function safely as possible. I try not just to say safely because there's so many unpredictable things in the environment that it's hard to prepare someone for every possible situation or circumstance. Um, we want people to get through the environment as efficiently or as quickly as they can, gracefully, independently. And so just trying to promote that type of travel and to get people able to perform those skills. Orientation mobility does provide opportunities for exploring. I like this quote that people never learn anything by just being told they have to find out for themselves. And that's what we're trying to do with O&M. Sitting in the classroom or listening to experiences from someone else doesn't give you the full understanding of the world around you of uh, different concepts. So the more that we can get people to have those experiences, to get into those other environments, it's going to benefit them long-term. Orientation mobility specialists are the professionals that teach these skills, working with individuals who are blind or visually impaired, can work with children in the schools, essentially birth to 21, or adults in um, adult rehabilitation. Certification through ACVREP. Also, there's the National Orientation Mobility Credential, or certification, sorry. And I'm just gonna talk some about how concepts of o &M relate to other skills, other areas of development. It really provides freedom. So things that we tend to take for granted as far as when you can go somewhere or um, having to plan ahead or rely on someone else it at least helps to alleviate some of that, give someone a little bit more freedom, more self-confidence. Orientation mobility is listed as a service under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and the Re uh, Rehabilitation Act. So it is integrated into those services. It does help to support concept development and kind of learning in all different areas. So it's going to support other skills and content knowledge. It is something that tends to be critical for employment, at least the percentages of what we see as far as the orientation skills that someone has and the uh, percentage of people that are employed. Orientation mobility tends to be one of those critical skills. And essentially it's going to provide the base of a lot of different 
areas that are going to be important for development. Um, as it relates to IDEA, it is listed that skills and instruction has to include school, home, and community environments. And that tends to be an important concept, especially with some of the things that we're going through related to like restrictions and how services can be provided. So in the school environment, does make perfect sense. That's where the child is receiving their education or if they're in early intervention, maybe they'll receive services at home. Um, although other students can also receive student services at home. But the community is the big thing because a lot of schools restrict instruction going off the school campus and to get those more advanced skills to be able to do like intersection crossings, more uh, unfamiliar environments to go to essentially anywhere that their peers without disabilities would be going. Those are the environments that they should be learning to navigate. So the mall would be a natural place. And so it sometimes is restricted where that instruction can be provided. And it really is critical that students get that community experience. So O&M, as it relates to early development and early intervention, it helps students or it helps children to become more comfortable in those environments that self-initiated movement, the more that we can encourage that and support children to do that independently, it's going to benefit them in many different ways. It's going to help support muscular development and motor skills. It's going to help improve cognitive development. Like the more new experiences a child can have, the more auditory um, stimuli that they're aware of, tactual stimuli, the more that they're building their own kind of cognitive understanding of their environment. And that's also going to be true for social emotional skills and communication skills. It's going to improve how they're able to interact with family, interact with other kids. So again, it's skills that are really critical for other areas of development. So some of this is things that I already talked about, but I was just going to mention the psychological impact. I'm sure everyone can relate to this right now about your mental well-being when you are stuck at home all the time or you are not able to go kind of where you want freely. It really does affect you and I think the more that people can have that freedom to go to different environments, again, it is going to help them psychologically. Obviously going to help physically, the more that someone travels, the more that they walk, it is going to improve their physical development. Again, the social development as people interact with others in public, economic development or economic also related to being employed and more likely with orientation mobility skills. Um, daily living, again, just being independent in your own home is a key part of any daily living skills. And then problem solving, as people get more into those different environments, unfamiliar environments, like if someone is able to problem solve and figure out how to get back to their destination or how to reorient Again, it's gonna benefit them in many different ways. Those skills are gonna transfer to other parts of their life. I 
I wanted to just briefly mention the core curriculum, like the kind of standard academic curriculum that we think about in schools and how that relates to O&M, just because orientation mobility is one of those things that kind of gets pushed aside and academics are often treated as like the mandatory things that students need to learn, which I do understand. And I think a lot of it comes back to standardized testing. So you have to be taught all of these specific things so that you can be ready for standardized tests where orientation mobility is not part of that. But again, orientation mobility can provide some of these same concepts and improve someone's I guess, experience related to them. So like using GPS devices and understanding how they work is gonna to relate to geography. Um, again, physical fitness as it relates to physical education and just having better balance and kind of awareness of your environment. So even though it's not part of the core curriculum, the benefits that they get from orientation mobility really is just almost something that you can't describe and you can't quantify. And the same thing for the expanded core curriculum, which are those nine areas that we focus on for students with visual impairments. Orientation mobility is also going to improve someone's use of assistive technology just like the smartphone is becoming one of the most used low vision devices just because it is so accessible and everyone has them. So being able to use that to take a picture of um, a product in a store or a bus schedule. So again, applying those skills to real situations and real environments. And also with social interactions, again, the more someone can get out into the public and have more diverse experiences, being able to solicit assistance or ask for directions, again, is going to benefit them in many different ways. I think understanding the role that vision plays related to our travel is also important to understand. So often, so much of what we learn about our environment is through vision. It's how we kind of initially get a spatial concept of our surroundings and kind of incorporate new concepts as we gain new experiences. It provides a lot of information about things at a distance where you might not have the same awareness of what is at a distance if it's not immediately tactual or auditorily available. Being able to integrate all of that sensory information together, you can see the thing is the thing that is making a specific noise and kind of connect those concepts. And also just understanding the age at which a student lost their vision is critically important and just the role that visual memory plays in that concept development. So if a child lost their vision before they have any visual memory, they are going to learn about the spatial world around them much differently and have to be explicitly taught some of those skills where a child that has those visual concepts is going to have a different understanding of like what a bus is because they're going to be able to see and kind of put those concepts together much easier compared to a student that's totally blind that is going to have to be explicitly taught each of the individual parts of that bus, how the wheels work, how windows around the bus are arranged, how uh, kids enter and exit the bus. So putting all those concepts together, it just needs to be explicitly taught in a different way where visual memory can allow you to have a kind of greater 
understanding of how things fit together. So I have a little bit on here about skills and techniques, and I was just going to mention the role of the O&M specialist related to this type of instruction. And it's really that O&M specialists are providing assessments, designing instruction and programs, working on IEPs or the paperwork and meetings related to adult rehabilitation, uh, direct instruction in like the use of the cane or adaptive mobility device, indoor and community travel. And then what I really wanted to mention is supporting the information and efforts of everyone else that works with that student or family of that individual. So providing the information and how they can support orientation mobility skills or providing feedback on maybe how something can be done a little bit differently or how the environment can be adapted. So it's also supporting and communicating with the rest of the individuals around that specific person. And originally I was gonna cover multiple techniques and at least talk about these in depth. I think it's gonna be more challenging virtually and I know they are gonna be doing some demonstrations of human guide stuff after this. I just wanted to briefly talk about one of these techniques and just kind of go through protective techniques a little bit. So I just want everyone, you can close your eyes, you don't have to close your eyes and we're gonna talk about protective techniques. So if you take your right arm, reach it across your body and put it on your left shoulder and then take that same arm and extend it outward and bend it at the elbow so your arm is stretching and still covering the opposite side of your body and then turn and face your palm outwards. And then I want you to take your other arm at your belly button and reach it directly out in front of you where the back of your hand is facing outward and your arm is, your hand is still kind of at the middle of your body. And so you, your arm should be angled downward and straight in front of your belly button. And that's all upper and lower protective techniques are. So if you're walking around in the middle of the night, you can incorporate those. The main reason I wanted to do that and kind of go over that is that entire explanation, assuming that people actually did the techniques right, I can't see a lot of you, but that entire explanation, I never had to touch you. I never had to manipulate your body. There were no physical guidance or cues or anything like that. And mainly I wanted to talk about that because it's such a natural instinct to want to move someone's body, to position it in a certain way, to just grab someone and drag them across the street or to just physically move someone instead of trying to verbally explain it. And I think that's something that people with visual impairments are constantly <laughs> interacting with people that way. So the more that you can provide a verbal description, I think that's generally going to be easier for a lot of people or preferential. Um, Certainly the physical prompting and cues are necessary in a lot of situations, but I just wanted to mention that because don't make that necessarily your default way of approaching that description or interacting with someone. Okay. I 
think that's probably enough on techniques. Um, I just wanted to talk about how some of these skills in motor events develop, especially related to young kids as we're promoting that early movement and development. So concepts develop in our understanding develops from simple to complex. That's how all of orientation mobility is designed. So understanding what your arm is before talking about what your wrist is. So larger concept and kind of more easier to understand versus something that's a little bit more detailed. Uh, first to find motor skills. So large scale movements comp compared to like bigger movements and um, like grasping that type of stuff. Uh, functional to abstract. So understanding how a clock works in the hands of a clock before describing something as like clock face directions. Egocentric to exocentric is just saying that I want to understand where the door is in relation to my body before I would be able to think about where the door is in relation to the kitchen. So everything kind of starts from your own egocentric perspective and then eventually you're able to think about how objects relate to each other. And also midline to lateral. So interacting with things that are directly in front of you before you're able to kind of spread your awareness to things outside of that. It's also going to be easier to reach directly in front of you compared to like reaching across your body. want to talk a little bit about auditory skills and hearing as it relates to o &M, just because I think these are sometimes overlooked as far as how important auditory information is and how much it is something that people actually need to practice and kind of refine their understanding of auditory information. So if someone does not have any vision or has very low vision, they're going to rely a lot on auditory information. It helps to provide awareness of your environment. So if you can hear the constant traffic going back and forth on a street that's ahead of you, you can keep that in that same position as you walk towards that street and you can maintain your orientation based on that kind of constant sound. Same thing if you're walking away from that street, again, keeping it directly behind you. Um, also, if you're walking down the street, hearing traffic directly to the side of you, and again, keeping your orientation in the same direction as you continue to walk. And also just being aware of auditory landmarks and the environment. This is a huge uh, skill that people are able to rely on a lot, especially indoors, as it mentions kind of where the elevator is, the ding or people entering or exiting the elevator, sounds of the water fountain, sounds of air conditioners, um, the sound of like a large open space in a lobby or something like that. So again, kind of maintaining that awareness of auditory sounds, it really is a critical skill. And the more that there tends to be that background or ambient noise, the more that that can kind of interfere with someone's ability to hear and interpret auditory information. I'm just going to talk a little bit about 
mobility tools and systems. So the white cane essentially someone's using that to preview their environment. So it's kind of clearing the path for where they're about to step. So you're looking for obstacles, you're looking for changes in the surface. You're looking for drop-offs. So things at ground level, curbs, stairs, that kind of thing. Uh, if there's a hole in the ground, if there's a bunch of broken up pavement because of construction. So protection from those kind of hazards. It does identify someone as visually impaired. They're probably, there is not more of a symbol of blindness in the US than a white cane, as we just had white cane day a couple weeks ago. Um, but it's providing some information to everyone around them. So if they do need assistance, it's probably gonna be a little bit easier to solicit assistance or someone may just offer. And it's gonna provide some information to drivers that the person crossing the street or about to cross the street has a visual impairment. Some people like being identified as a person with a visual impairment and some people don't like that, but that's another discussion. Uh, also kind of thinking about the cane as an extension of their arm or of their body. So you want to tactually explore and feel what's on the ground or kind of protecting if there's something out there, but this is a way to do that without having to crawl on the ground without having to get your hand in whatever mess is out there on the pavement. But it still allows you to actually explore and to get a lot of feedback from the cane. And they're also very portable. They can be folded up easily and fit in like a bag or even a pocket and very durable. They tend to last pretty long certainly have had students snap them as well. Uh, just a little bit of information about dog guides. Thinking about dog guides as a traveling team. So it's the individual and the dog together that is able to travel. And the person's maintaining the orientation to their environment and aware of where they want to go, where they need to turn, those kind of things. The dog is just the mobility tool. So it's, you decide where you want to go and it takes you straight in that direction. It turns when you tell it to turn. Um, it, the dog might have some recollection of like specific destinations and like a specific route but it's still up to the individual to figure out how to travel through that environment. Always greeting the handler before the dog. I'm very much a dog person and I absolutely love dogs, but also keeping in mind that, again, the dog is part of that traveling team and always greet the person first. I'm sure you've heard this before, never pet a working dog in a harness without permission. And I think a lot of people would even say, don't ask permission, but I think there's different feelings on that. Um, and also just understanding that a person with a dog guide really has to have strong orientation mobility skills. Because again, they are maintaining their awareness of everything around them. And the dog is just kind of navigating around obstacles and keeping that person away from those kind of hazards. So often you'll hear kids say that they're not gonna learn to use the cane, they're just gonna wait and get a dog guide. 
And that's not the case. That's not going to happen. And you also need a recommendation from an orientation mobility specialist. I want to talk a little bit about referrals just because these are, there's often students that fall through the cracks. So students that get referred for orientation mobility assessments, often if they have a significant acuity impairment, a significant peripheral field loss, or a progressive visual loss like retinitis pigmentosa. So those tends, tend to be the more obvious cases. Someone sees that diagnosis and knows likely that they are going to need orientation mobility instruction. Um, some of the other things that you notice as far as behaviors of a student that might need to be referred if they're relying on human guide a lot or that behavior kind of suddenly changes. If someone's looking at the ground a lot as they're walking, so that might indicate that they have a lower field loss. I wouldn't necessarily equate orientation mobility with needing to have a cane. There are gonna be students with low vision that are able to travel without a cane, but still can benefit from orientation mobility for a lot of those other skills and how they solicit assistance and how they navigate through different environments or use their vision more efficiently. Um, for students that are not going to be drivers, thinking about, again, how they are going to function compared to their peers of the same age without disabilities, so they're going to start driving and that individual at least needs some sort of alternative long term and ultimately for that goal of employment or higher education, whatever it is. And often you might see some inconsistency in how someone travels between environments. So this is most often the familiar versus unfamiliar that I'll see someone, well, okay, I'll see a child traveling in a school and they run down the hall, they go down two flights of stairs in about three seconds just because they're so fast, it is a little reckless, but, um, They're so familiar, they're so comfortable in that environment, they don't even have to think about it. They know where everything is. They have probably done this multiple times. And then you take them to an unfamiliar environment. Maybe they're going to the high school the next year or the middle school or even just some other environment that they're not familiar with or an unfamiliar part of the school. And it's a totally different student. It's their travel performance seems completely different. They're much more hesitant. They're much more cautious. They're constantly looking down. Like I've seen plenty of those type of behaviors that is kind of astounding in what you see between a familiar and unfamiliar environment. Um, and mainly I wanted to mention that because I think a lot of the students that fall through the cracks that don't get referred are these students or individuals with low vision. Again, because their vision loss may not be severe where someone doesn't think that they need mobility or that they're able to travel well enough that it seems like probably it would not benefit them, um, which very well could be the case, but I think it's just keeping some of these things in mind. So for individuals with low vision, again, 
some with more severe impairments, individuals that may be dependent on the situation or the environment, no observable mobility issues. If someone has additional disabilities, that can also impact how we think about their mobility, that either someone is often not provided the opportunity to be independent or that maybe they haven't reached their potential for mobility just because, again, they are not provided that as an option. And just overall that individuals with low vision often don't receive orientation mobility as often as they probably should. The role of family and other professionals, I think, is critical in orientation mobility. Just being able to monitor how someone is using techniques, being able to reinforce appropriate techniques. And again, techniques are designed a particular way because it is a safety issue that we want someone moving their cane, the full width of their body or outside of the width of their body so that you are protecting that full area. And that, you know, if you miss a street sign or something like that, that that can be a real issue and you can run into those type of obstacles. Um, I think encouraging independence is probably the biggest thing. I know a lot of families, once the student is home, they're not necessarily encouraged to be independent or that often it's not thought about that the cane should be going with that student everywhere they go. A lot of times it is just convenience and things can go quicker if someone is helping that child and not necessarily um, waiting for them to do something independently, even though it might be a little bit more slowly. Um, the other thing, my last bullet there, let them be kids, I think really is critical. Uh, I think too often we try to shelter kids with disabilities, especially kids with visual impairments, because we are afraid of what can happen or we tend to think of the worst case scenario, but also understanding sheltering them is not benefiting them long term. It's okay if they fall and scrape their leg. It's okay if they have the same type of experiences that every other kid has. That is part of learning. That is part of how you become more aware of things in the environment. So at least children also need that opportunity to fail that opportunity to fall, that opportunity to get back up. Um, and someone can still be there to support them and encourage them or if, you know, prevent some real catastrophe from happening, but also just understanding you want to give them the chance to be independent just like any other child. And again, it is going to help all of those areas of development, concept development, motor development, long term kind of career aspirations. And along those same lines, I would also encourage if there are siblings playing with that child, that tends to be one of the I guess biggest things that can also help just because siblings are not going to treat the child any differently. Siblings tend to <laughs> um, be a little bit more aggressive or kind of rough with children and in the long term that can be a good thing for some of these kids. Just to be one of the group. 
see. Okay. Um, some of the challenges that we face in orientation mobility often relate to the environment. So often it's inaccessible information as far as what street this is, as far as what business this is, how do I get to this specific destination, um, what building on campus is this, what classroom, all of that kind of stuff. And there are ways that you can adapt the environment to make that more accessible. So that can be like a tactile marker outside of a classroom or a tactile marker on a student's hook where they hang their jacket and backpack. Um, out more in the community, it's a little harder to adapt the environment because often that's not up to us, but what smartphones and like GPS devices have been doing is to provide a lot of that information or to make it accessible. And I think that's going to keep improving and kind of being integrated into aspects of independent travel. Um, let's see. These are just some of the different environmental conditions that can be troublesome for individuals as far as lighting, elevation, or different kind of like waist high or higher objects. Let's see. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes, I think. Um, I'm just briefly going to mention the school, home, and community aspect as it relates to the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So again, instruction should occur related to all those environments or related to the student's need to travel in those environments. And so students should not be restricted from receiving O&M instruction off campus. Um, I think this is gonna continue to be a big debate just because there are liability issues and a lot of places it's ultimately up to the school to provide that transportation or it really shouldn't be up to the parents to provide that transportation, but I know that happens in a lot of cases too. But the basic idea is that you can't replicate what they're going to get out of the natural environment in some environment that is on the school grounds or something that's, you know, you're artificially creating. So traveling on the sidewalk up to the front of the school isn't the same as traveling along the sidewalk in an unfamiliar environment or when there's like heavier traffic that's traveling alongside you. And just understanding that experiences in natural environments is critical. This goes back to what I was talking about as far as letting children have experiences. And part of that is we also need to prepare them for how to interact in those different environments, how to be able to judge and manage risks, how to develop more confidence, how to recover when something doesn't go right, how to remain patient. So we need to provide a provide support as children are le learning these skills so that we can be there to reinforce or kind of refine maybe how they are assessing those different risks. And the more that we're able to still provide their 
be there to provide some assistance, the more children are going to be independent. And so they need to go through a process where they are developing those skills, just like any other child. And you can't shelter them from those experiences because again, it's not going to be in their best interest long term. I have a couple resources up here. Um, the eight year Orientation Mobility Division, AER is the Association for Education and Rehabilitation of the Blind and Visually Impaired. Um, there is an Orientation Mobility Division. Uh, so on the website, there is a scope of practice paper that goes into a lot of detail about what Orientation Mobility is and it also has the information in there about like IDEA and other things that can be used to advocate for the needs of students that should be receiving O&M or are receiving. It also is appropriate for adult services. So I was part of that paper and it is a great resource. Um, also on the O&M division page there are all the position papers related to Kind of controversial topics in the field. If you're not aware of Paths to Technology, I highly recommend it. This is from Perkins eLearning and they have kind of shared ideas for lessons and additional resources that essentially anyone can contribute to and it's an incredible list of what people have been doing related to their O&M instruction. It is mainly focused on kids. Um, and they also have a lot of great information on there related to remote instruction and kind of things related to the pandemic. And also I would mention Live Finders. If, again, if you're not aware of this, this is something where essentially anyone can post information and kind of share information and like post folders of resources. And Chris Tad from Texas School for the Blind has really developed an impressive list of resources for orientation mobility. So if you go to livebinders.com and just search for Chris Tad, T-A-B-B, or probably search for orientation mobility, all those res resources should come up. And again, there are a lot of good things related to remote instruction and kind of what's currently going on. I just briefly wanted to mention this. Uh, the American Foundation for the Blind conducted a survey on access and engagement for students with visual impairments during the pandemic. Uh, again, I was part of this project. They have a site access and, or wait, it's access engagement.com. I think you can also get to this just from the main AFB site. So there are some interesting results on there related to um, COVID-19 and how children are receiving services. Just the executive report is posted right now, but I think within the next week we will have the full report posted with all of the information and that there will be recommendations on instruction for working with students during COVID-19. Uh, the other survey that they did was focused on adults and transition and transportation. Uh, and I believe it's flattening, oh, it's flattenedinaccessibility.com. And you should also be able to get to that from the main AFB page. So I kind of just wanted to open it up for questions. Um, I do have a couple of things I was wondering about, like if people are concerned about any of the things related to O&M in Kentucky or things related to COVID-19. But 
I'm open to whatever other questions you might have. You may use your chat box. Kelly has one. Um, are O and M specialists only available in schools? Uh, no. I tend to talk a lot about schools because that's primarily where I work, and our O and M program is a little more focused on school age, but essentially. O&M specialists work in early intervention services like VIPs, work for public schools, work for schools for the blind, and work for adult rehabilitation agencies, um, often might work for the state providing services or like a lighthouse for the blind. And I also know there are a lot of independent contractors that might work with children as well as adults. So this this attendee says that um, how was questioning how a working adult with RP, for instance, finds an O and M specialist to receive assistance with daily life. Um, he or she has has tried googling in their area, but the only things they come up with our programs to learn how to be a specialist or specialist in schools. So it's not the easiest thing, especially if someone is in a rural area. Like I would think it's probably going to be easier to find someone in Lexington or Louisville. Um, the main resource for that that I know of as far aside from just asking people and talking to see who might be providing as an independent contractor. I know there is a list also that Chris Tab was developing and also that I think is on Live Binders. Um, but basically this was a national list of people that were interested in providing contract O&M work. Um, And the other site actually that Chris Tab had, I'm just going to post here. It's aerom.org. And that's what we ended up using as a place just to put a bunch of information because it was challenging to get things posted on the AER website sometimes. We have another question. Uh, what do you think of using a white support cane? I am 78 with low intermittent vision. So using a white support cane kind of as more of an identifier as someone with a visual impairment? Um, I think that's probably what that kind of means. I. I think that's absolutely fine. I think that is a way to still get that kind of message across that someone has a visual impairment that they, you know, potentially might ask for assistance or that someone might offer assistance. I, I'm not sure like that's going to work the same way as the white cane law that like when you're crossing a street or something like that. But generally, I think it's fine for someone to use a white or white and red support cane. Okay, and the next question is, how do you feel COVID has affected sighted God for the blind? That's actually a more challenging question than <laughs> I would think it would be. Um, I think it's easy to, or it, I don't want to group everyone together and say everyone is impacted in the same way because we just know that's not true. Everyone is going to have different experiences. Um, what 
I have seen in what I think is showed in some of those studies, it really has had a significant impact on restricting travel. So there's a lot more regulations related to public transit or kind of reduced hours of when public transit's available or making it a little bit more challenging in some cases to use Uber. I also think in some ways it might make things a little bit easier if people are able to work from home instead of having to travel to work. And especially for schools, because O&M is not considered an essential service, a lot of times O&M is just being provided virtually right now, which you can only do so much. Like you can talk about concepts, you can talk about um, like researching maps online or like GPS, that kind of stuff. But you're going to run out of things that are actually helpful and relevant to that student pretty quick. So I think there are a lot of kids that are kind of falling behind related to their O&M skills. And I also think that they're kind of traveling even less now because they are at home so much that I've heard students actually say that they had more freedom at school than they do at home. And I mean, part of that might be that parents are just being cautious because of COVID, but I also think that um, Okay. That there's a lot of things that go into that. Sorry. Go ahead. No. Um, should O and M be referred every time a FVLMA has to be completed on an initial evaluation for a student with a visual impairment? Again, not an easy question. <laughs> um, my opinion, I say yes, but ultimately, it's not up to me. In Texas their state law is now that every child that is referred for VI, so every time a new student is being evaluated by TBI, they're also evaluated for O&M. And those are completely different, like they don't have to qualify for services by the TBI to get services from the O&M. Um, I think that would be ideal if we could have every student evaluated because I also think that there's a lot of, as I was saying, a lot of kids that kind of fall through the cracks. Realistically, we don't have enough O&M specialists to evaluate every student and I think there's already shortages and to provide enough services for the students that we already have on caseloads or even for adult services. So I think that would be great in the future. I don't think it's going to happen soon, though, at least in Kentucky. The next question is, what is your thought about hybrid, no noise vehicles? Do these vehicles pose more of a risk to individuals with visual impairments when trying to get around by foot than other vehicles? I would, so I think anyone that's traveled around those kind of vehicles would probably say yes, just because so much of what we teach in O&M is to rely on traffic sounds, to rely on that specific car when you know that car is going, and you're using that as an indicator for when that light is green and you're safe to go. But if I can't hear that car, it's going to be confusing at the very least um, if there's only one car there and not like multiple cars that you're trying to listen to. It can also be that if I'm listening for a car to go straight and this hybrid is just turning directly in front of me, I might not hear it at all until we're about at the same place as I'm crossing the street. So I think that's definitely a hazard. The other thing I would say the Environmental Access Committee for the o and Division does great work with this kind of stuff, um, advocating for like 
regulations related to APS signals, related to quiet vehicles. Um, Janet Barlow, who I think might not be the chair anymore, but has done incredible work related to quiet vehicles and like APS signals. So I think the more that we can incorporate the accessible pedestrian signals at intersections, it is gonna help to alleviate that. But yeah, that's still a ways away. I know there's also a lot of talk of having some sort of auditory sound specifically for the quiet cars, which is I know kind of the opposite of what most people want, but an indicator that would be there if someone is not able to see the car. Okay. Does the state ever plan to put information about O&M and White Cane back into the driving manual? I honestly have no idea about that. That is a good question, but that is very much outside of what I know. So I, I'm sorry, I can't even really attempt to answer that. Okay. Can you go over quickly the reason for the red tape on the car? On the cane? cane. I'm sorry, cane. Yeah, it, it just to make it stand out. So it's not any specific reason except that that is what they picked. And I think it's to give some, some contrast with the white on the cane. So that combination of the red and the white and both are reflective. So it stands out even at night when headlights shine on that. Um, as far as I know, that's all it is. It's just what they picked and that combination was easy to see. Jennifer has um, placed in the chat box that the manual has been rev revised last year and did include a section on blind pedestrians. And I do want to encourage everyone to, to look at the chat box because you're getting some additional information from our panelists uh, as well as those resources that we, um, we have in our audience. I think our final question is, do you have any resources for the blind who do not have a guide dog currently uh, can get help getting one or getting one trained that would help financially for persons who have Medicaid or Medicare? So resources for the blind does not have a guide dog. They don't have a guide dog and they, they, so I guess resources if they do not have and then how could they um, secure one mm -hmm. if they have I, Medicaid or Medicare. Okay. Again, I'm not completely sure related to like Medicaid or Medicare, but um, I would just start with calling and talking to people at the dog guide schools, talking to if you have an o and specialist that you've worked with. So I'm not completely sure how this process works now. Most guide schools, God, uh, guide dog schools provide dogs either for like a small charge. I think seeing eye is either 500 or like 150, but still much less than what the dog actually costs and provide that training and kind of provide support after that. Um, so I think it's just talking to those schools and seeing what they might charge, what criteria they might have for you to apply for a dog, but that would be a good place to start. So seeing eye, leader dogs in Michigan, uh, there's guiding eyes for the blind. I think that's in New York. Um, so there are a number of different schools and kind of the better, those better known ones are certainly very reputable. And so we've had set, uh, lots of information relative to this listed in the chat box, um, giving uh, different resources, Bluegrass Council of the Blind. Um, they're saying most of the, the, the guide dogs are free. Sometimes there's a, a small, small charge. Um, 
So National Federation for the Blind. So I, there's, there's lots of resources there for people to look at. Um, again, I think this is the final question. Uh, it's relatively simple, but do guide canes have to be white? So certainly don't have to be because there are canes that you can get from Ambutech that are solid colors, like solid blue, solid yellow, green, orange. You can get any of those. Um, they have combinations where it's, they have a different color handle. They have ones where the entire shaft is a different color. They have canes where it's white and then where it would be red is a different color. And they have different color tips. So all of those are options. But the only thing I would say, there is research on this and they have found that people did not stop as often when someone was crossing the street without a white and red cane. So that still very much is the symbol that people think about and they reacted, drivers reacted more cautiously and stopped more often for pedestrians that were crossing with a red and white cane. So certainly can use any, but that difference kind of stands out to me. Okay, and we had one comment uh, that certainly agreed with you and uh, added that single color canes are not protected under the Kentucky white cane law and reduce visibility. Okay, I think that does conclude our questions. Um, as you can see, we had much interest in your presentation. Dr. Kayser, we just appreciate uh, everything that you have offered and uh, very well organized. Uh, the, your contact information is there. So uh, everyone okay. get that down. Can I also just mention our new orientation mobility program at UK? I posted it in the chat box, but if you just search for UKY orientation mobility, it'll come up. All right. <clears throat> we'll give everybody a few minutes to look at that and jot it down. And again, we are so, so appreciative of your time that you've given us today with this vital information. Thank you. All right. If you thought that was a great uh, presentation, let's, put, let's uh, acknowledge that in the chat box. And uh, I will tell you that you are receiving several right now. So again, thank you, Dr. Casey. Thank you. We're gonna go right on to our next and third session. It's entitled Guide Techniques and is presented by Jennifer Rorick and Kenny Williams. And these are members of our EOS Steering Committee, Planning Committee. Jennifer Rorick is an Orientation and Mobility Specialist for the Kentucky Office of Vocational Rehabilitation Blind Services. She trains consumers to navigate within a variety of environments and promotes greater independence and confidence to individuals with visual impairments. Kenny Williams is a community volunteer and is involved with the Bluegrass Council of the Blind. He was born blind, the eldest of four children, and graduated from Moorhead State University. Kennedy, Kenny is employed by Domino's Pizza and is an accomplished musician, vocalist, leader, and volunteer in church and community. So welcome Jennifer and Kenny, and we're looking forward to your presentation on guide techniques. Thank you, Diana. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, so I really just wanted to provide some practical tips for individuals that may be working with 
the blind or visually impaired. The biggest tip I can provide is communication. Ask the individual what they need and how you can help them. So if you are going into a home and working with someone that say has macular degeneration, it's very important that the environment makes sense to them. It may not necessarily make sense to those of us that are sighted, but that's okay. So it's important that we leave the furniture um, where it is, don't move things around. You know, you might leave the remote um, that's black on a dark couch, but they may not be able to find that. And so it's important to put things back uh, where they're at and to leave furniture where it is so that as they're going through an environment, they're creating a mental map of the layout of the land. So they understand where they are in relation to all the other objects in the environment. And so our goal here is for consistency. So if one individual is going in and working with someone and they know guide techniques, it's important to make some notes and put it in that individual's file so that if someone else comes in, that they can look at the file beforehand and be prepared to greet that individual and have an idea of how to guide them. So to demonstrate the guide techniques, let's go ahead and set up the video. Hi, this week's Shortcut with Laura Bain. I'm standing outside the Halifax CNIV with a very special guest, my sister, Allison Bain. Hi, Allison. Hey, Laura. And you've been leading me sighted guide for years, but we don't know if we're doing it properly. So today we're gonna to get a lesson on sighted guide technique. Great. Let's head inside. Once inside, we meet up with CNIB Orientation and Mobility Specialist, Johanna Stork. Johanna, thanks so much for meeting Allison and me today. No problem. All right, what's the first thing that we should know about Sighted Guide? Well, first of all, you should never approach somebody and grab them and pull them to direct them where to go. That can be very uncomfortable. I agree, that's the worst. <laughs> So what you do want to do is offer assistance. Let them know who you are. And if somebody does would like some assistance, then you can show them where you are by touching the back of your hand to theirs. That's right. And then you can take the back of your sister's arm uh, and she can guide you just by relaxing and walking and you can feel a, a lot of feedback from her body through the top of her arm. Allison stays about half a step ahead so I can feel her movements and respond. I think we've got the basics down. Do you think we're ready to head outside? Yeah, I think we are. All right, let's go. So when approaching stairs, make sure you stop when you get to the top of the stairs and describe the stairs to the person you're guiding. Make sure you approach the stairs squarely, not at an angle. If there's a railing available, make sure to tell her if it's on the right or the left um, so that she can take it if she'd like. Let them know whether the stairs are going up or down um, and approximately how many stairs there are. So um, approach the stairs and stop just as you're about to take the step onto the first stair and that's where you can stop so uh, that Laura knows exactly where the first step is. Okay, we've got about three stairs here so let's head down. Okay, great, let's go. We head off to a local pub for some real world practice. First lesson, getting through the door. So guiding through a door, uh, Allison is always gonna go through the door first and then whoever you're guiding is gonna follow behind. Uh, it's important to describe which side of you the door is gonna be on, so either the left side or the right side as you're passing through. And um, 
whether the door pulls towards you or pushes away. And also any other important details, like if there's a step at the door or maybe before or after the door. Okay, great. Yeah, I don't want to fall down any stairs. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right, let's head inside. <laughs> So, Laura, the door is going to be on your left, and there's a small step up. Okay, great. It looks kind of narrow in here, Johanna. It sure does. So, a uh, comfortable way to squeeze through a narrow space will be to go single file. And as always, Allison's going to go first as the guide. Um, and a good cue to go uh, get into the single file uh, position is for you to put your arm behind your back. Uh, and then that'll be a cue for you, Laura, to slide your hand down and hold on to Allison's wrist, and that way you won't be stepping on her heels. All right, one thing that can be super awkward when you have low vision is when you can't find a chair. Right. So the easiest thing is if your guide will take their guiding hand and put it on the back of the chair and let you know that it's tucked into the table and any other relevant details. So whether it has wheels or something like that. Yeah, all that would be good to know. Yeah. Or if they're guiding you to the front of a chair, they can bring you right up almost so your knees are touching the front of the chair and describe where it is. Help you avoid sitting in someone's lap. Johanna, thanks so much for the lesson today. You're so welcome. So when you are parting ways with somebody that you're guiding, make sure you let them know where they are and to let them know that you're leaving. So I guess I'll see you later. Thanks, Johanna. Okay, take care. Bye. Well, I'm glad that you finally learned how to give me proper sight of guide. Yeah, you're lucky I don't walk you into a pole. Hey now. All right, well, we're at the uh, number seven rest stop now, so I'm gonna head off back to work. Okay, sounds good. I'll call you later? Yeah, sounds good. All right, bye. See you. All right, thank you. So I just wanna add that um, it's important that you communicate uh, with the person that's visually impaired, uh, any obstacles or anything that you might find uh, that may be a bit unusual. So they did a very good job about explaining about the stairs or a step up as you're going through the door. But it's also important to explain as you're going through the environment, um, the, the layout. So for example, we have tables and chairs on our left or the vending machines are on our right so that they're creating that mental map as you're guiding them to the environment because you know there may be times when they may have to wait for a ride or wait for someone to come and get them to take them uh, to the office or you know, there could be a lot of situations where they may be by themselves and they may need to know or solicit information to know where the restroom is or something, something like that. So it's important that you share as much information as they're comfortable with. Uh, so again, the most important thing is ask, find out how they want to be guided. Some people may not need the physical guidance. Some people may just want verbal instructions. But again, you want to tell them where you're going. We're going to the office. It's the third door on the left. So uh, let's turn this over to Kenny Williams. And Kenny, would you share with us your perspective on how individuals can help you in a variety sure, of Jennifer. I would love that. Um, for me, I have found that communication is the most important thing of all. If visually impaired viewers as well as caregivers and care providers um, take anything away from this symposium today, it would be this one thing that I, I, I would hope they would take away. Communication is, is the key. 
we as visually impaired people, um, I've learned I have to be assertive and assert my needs. Uh, they, people in the sighted world, they don't know what my needs are. They can kind of anticipate and kind of uh, know what it is, but I have to be able to tell them what I need when I need it. And I take it one step further and, and tell them why I need it this way. Oh, and yeah. once I go that, that to that extent, then they, they always understand why I need it that way. And it ends up being a teachable moment for me. So I'm never afraid to tell you what I want or what I need from you, regardless whether you ask me or if I ask you. I'll let you know what I need. And I think that's very important. Um, I've had people in the grocery store where I've asked for directions to a particular aisle in the grocery store. Um, they don't give me clear directions. So I ask questions. Knowing the appropriate questions to ask, words are power. And you have to be precise. And I try to be concise in the least amount of words to get my point across. This is what I need. And this is how I need it. Um, not just the grocery store, but doctor's offices, um, in the mall, restaurants, um, as far as creating that visual map for myself, I listen to everything around me. I, I, I like to think that everything talks. Everything has a voice. I can hear the wind. I can hear the cars. I can hear a door. Whether or not it's open or closed. I can get a rough estimate of the size of a room from the way a sound sounds in that room. I can pick up on a lot of things, how tall a person is, just from listening. So listening plays a very important part of my orientation and my orientation plays a big key in the way I'm able to uh, be mobile. All right. Well, thank you, Kenny. And before we move to uh, questions, the code word is sweet potato. Sweet potato. I have a question for Kenny. Kenny, how did the school support O&M for you back in the day? Um, you know, I, I really wasn't privileged to sit in the, the meetings, the planning meetings, and I forget the letters that they're called, but there's you TVIs will know what I'm talking about. Um, but 
a lot of logical and critical thinking, um, problem solving classes were incorporated into my uh, early classroom experience. I mean, first, second, third grade, putting puzzles together. Um, then as I got older, um, the math, as far as geometry with graphing um, and the angles, because I later learned in life that that would play a big important part in the way that I acclimated myself to my environment with 90 degree turns uh, to the left or 90 degree turns to the right, uh, 180 degree turn to the left or 180 degree turn to the right, 45 degree turns to the left or right. And this played a very big important part in finding localities. Okay. Are there other questions that some of you would like to put in the chat box for Jennifer and Kenny? I want to say to both of you that you know, someone with vision sitting here and listening to you, uh, what an impact your presentation had. And um, you, you put it, you framed it in a, in a way that I think makes all of us realize the importance of the research and the advancements that are being made, but just what, how you have uh, been able to navigate. Well, thank you so much. I had uh, a lot of support as a child, as a teenager, and as a young adult. Um, I had some very, very strong orientation and mobility instructors um, that were key influential individuals in developing the person, the independent person that I am. And I tip my hat to all you orientation and mobility instructors. God bless each and every one of you. I love you. Mm -hmm. We do have a question here. It says, how do you approach uh, a parent who has been so independent throughout their life and now needs help with getting around visually and et cetera? That's a very good question. Um, so I do work uh, with adults um, for the State Office of Vocational Rehabilitation Blind Services. So I do encounter a lot of older adults who are beginning to show signs of macular degeneration, cataracts, uh, glaucoma. And it is difficult uh, because they're going through a grieving process, uh, you know, very similar to losing a loved one. Uh, and so teaching them uh, or trying to reach them and trying to get them to to accept uh, services and help can can be difficult. But I think it's important. Um, a couple of things I think are very important. Number one, be encouraging and and encourage them to do for themselves as much as they can. There's a big difference between encouraging and enabling. And so if we treat our older adults as uh, helpless, then they're gonna start to believe that. They're gonna feel helpless. And it's not just for older adults, that's for anyone that might be visually impaired. So, you know, there could be an accident or, or something of that nature. But we can't, 
we can't treat them, um, you know, like a, a, a fragile little china cup um, that we only, you know, uh, pay attention to or get out on special occasions. We need to talk with them directly and try to encourage them to do as much as they can. Um, you know, include them in folding clothes, um, making dinner. Um, even if they don't feel comfortable chopping, they can tear lettuce. You know, they can do things, um, even small things for themselves can go a long way in boosting their self-confidence and getting them to the point to where they are ready to accept services. Okay, um, our, next, oh, okay. our next question is, do many people use echolocation for O&M? Yes, echolocation is an extremely important concept in O&M. So when I'm working with an individual on street crossings, uh, we start out in quiet residential neighborhoods. And one of the ways that you, t you can tell that you're at a street corner is by sound. Because buildings um, act as sound barriers. And so as you approach the intersection and suddenly that echolocation, the sound of traffic and things bouncing off that building, suddenly it's not as closed in anymore. And so you can hear the traffic on the perpendicular street go further and further down. And so suddenly you realize that you're at a street corner. And so just as Kenny talked about, listening to those sounds, the sound of the cane hitting up against metal that sound is gonna bounce off. And it's gonna sound different than hitting up against brick or glass. And so we're constantly using all of those senses to gather information to understand where we are within our environment. All right, is there any, if there are any more questions, please put those in now. Um, I encourage both of you to go to the chat box and see um, some really great compliments and appreciation for your presentation today. So I'm not seeing any more questions. And if not, we're gonna turn it over to Christy. We have some more recognitions of our sponsors and vendors. Hello everyone again. I hope you're enjoying the morning. Boy, we have been working on this for more than a year and it is so exciting that today is the day um, that it's coming alive and that you all are engaged. At, at one point we had 80 participants and it looks like a few are sending me emails that they got to drop off briefly and come back in. But I want to take this opportunity to introduce you to our next um, sponsor. This is Janelle Thomas. She's with KAER, which is the Kentucky Association for Education and Rehab of the Blind and Visual Impairment. And she's also, that's a mouthful, right? She's also, the sponsor, she's also the sponsor for our ACB REP CEU. So thank you so much for being with us. After Janelle talks, Mary will jump on and do a brief on the next bit of vendors, and then you all are free to take a nice lunch break. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you. Um, I am the past president of KAER, and we are an organization of professionals who work with, um, or in the blindness field. So we have everyone from um, individuals who work with teeny tiny babies all the way up to individuals um, that work with people who are in their 90s or sometimes older than that. Um, so we have a wide variety of, of members. Um, if you're interested in joining, you can go to aerbvi.org and um, that is our international association. Um, and that will give you the different options for joining. 
I will say that in terms of benefits, I've been doing a lot of webinars um, since all the COVID stuff started that are free in general. And um, there's been some really good information on that. So um, Dr. Kaiser was talking about the orientation and mobility division of that. Um, so some good things going on there. Uh, the main thing we wanted to talk about and make sure that you are aware of is that on March 3rd, we will be doing our annual conference virtually. This year, we are happy to say that we will pro be providing that at no cost. Um, we will have CEUs available. Um, we always do the ACVREP as well as the CRC credits for rehabilitation counselors. Um, we will be sending out a save the date here pretty soon. So be looking for that. And um, we're just happy that we were being, we were able to um, help sponsor the event this year. This has always been a great event when I've uh, attended and it's always good to hear some, some new information. So thank you all. Thank you, Janelle. All right, we have some more vendors. Hang on, let me share the screen. Yes, that's what I want to share. No, not for <laughs> Hold on, I am sorry, technical difficulties. Just because I didn't, um, <laughs> there we go. Current slide, aha, okay. All right, um, another one of our founding members for the Blind Services Coalition of Kentucky is the Bluegrass Council of the Blind. Bluegrass Council of the Blind's mission is to provide resources and services to all people affected by a loss of sight, improving lives for all by empowering persons with a loss of vision to continue living independently as productive, contributing members of their community, and to educate the public on the rights, abilities, and needs of the blind and visually impaired. Services are available to anyone directly or indirectly impacted by the effects of loss of sight. The Kentucky Talking Book Library provides free library service to people who cannot read traditional print because they have a visual, physical, or reading disability. For nearly 50 years, the Foundation Fighting Blindness has been the pioneer in innovative retinal disease research. They've been able to identify over 270 retinal disease causing genes, launch 40 clinical trials for potential treatments, and fund more than 90 research grants annually. The Kentucky Office for Vocational Rehabilitation Blind Services Division serves Kentuckians who are blind or visually impaired and assist individuals in obtaining and maintaining employment, economic self-sufficiency, self and independence. Their goal is to provide a myriad of resources and high quality services that are geared to enhance the Kentuckians, the lives of Kentuckians with visual disabilities. And that concludes the vendors. Nope, it does not. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, uh, Kristen Peary is going to be coming up um, after lunch. So um, we will be seeing her then. Now it is the end of all the vendors. All right, thank you so much, Mary. So um, now is a break. We will now begin the fourth session, Updates in Assistive Technology for Visual Impairment, presented by Dr. Kristen Peary. Dr. Peary is an assistant professor at the University of Kentucky Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, specializing in low vision services and specialty contact lenses. She completed the Doctor of Optometry at Southern College of Optometry in Memphis, Tennessee, followed with residency training at the Lexington Veterans Affair Medical Center with specialty training in ocular disease and low vision. She is currently working to grow a low vision department at UK Healthcare Advanced Eye Care to bring low vision services to outreach clinics to serve more low vision patients 
in Central and Eastern Kentucky. A warm welcome for Dr. Kristen Peary. So I'm going to talk today about um, low vision services and try to provide a little bit of an update on some changes in assistive technology. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to everybody who's put this together. Um, I have been able to attend the symposium a few times since I've been in Lexington and I've really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I, if anybody has any questions at the end, please don't hesitate to ask or to contact me. Um, our objectives today are to understand the components and benefits of a low vision exam, um, become familiar with available assistive technology and resources for low vision patients, and then understand how to implement this technology um, to be useful and practical for those with visual impairment, and then also to discuss some new technology advances and how those might apply to the visually impaired. My CEU code word for this presentation is SALMON. And I'll make sure and mention that again at the end of the presentation as well for anyone that misses it. So just to start with, um, kind of discuss a little bit, what exactly is low vision? What do we mean when we're talking about a low vision exam or a patient with low vision? One of the things that I've kind of found um, just through my research is there doesn't seem to be a universal definition of visual impairment. Um, many sources have different levels of visual acuity or measures of visual impairment. Um, it's been hard to find kind of a standard definition. Um, generally, though, it is determined by the um, best corrected distance visual acuity of the better seeing eye or by the extent of the visual field in the better seeing eye. A lot of times people will use the term or hear the term thrown around legal blindness. Um, that is actually just a term that's used by the U.S. government to establish eligibility for services and benefits. Um, you know, another source mentions um, level of 2070 vision or worse um, for sort of billable insurance codes for um, documenting low vision. Um, my personal definition is really that visual impairment starts when reduced vision begins to impact or affect a person's daily life. This can actually occur in many patients with um, what we would consider very mild visual impairment. Um, so we, you know, really in our low vision program, we aim to see if there's anywhere that we can improve the vision um, and really just sort of make things a little bit easier and more accessible. Um, these are just kind of a couple examples here of sort of where some of these definitions come from. And just you can see from looking at the difference in the World Health Organization's definition of low vision to what we consider legal blindness in the United States, um, there's just a large amount of discrepancy and kind of makes it difficult to quantify. So when we have a patient in for a low vision exam, the goal is really to determine the level of visual impairment that a patient has, how it affects their ability to function, and then also to develop strategies for implementing tools and resources to improve the quality of life. When most people are at a typical eye exam or someone with some sort of um, ocular disease, um, they're typically being seen by an ophthalmologist or an optometrist who is solely focused on managing and treating that disease process. Oftentimes, the impact that it has on a patient, um, their ability to function on a daily basis, navigate new environments, um, do the things that they enjoy doing is really overlooked. So we schedule a low vision exam to really sort of delve a little bit deeper into how a patient's visual impairment is affecting their life and what can we do to try to make that better. We typically break that down into several different components. Um, we try to take a very detailed history um, to help us really understand um, what a patient is having difficulties with and then what their particular, particular visual goals are. We do do visual acuity and visual field testing. This oftentimes looks different than it would in a typical exam. Um, most exams um, have sort of don't quantify vision loss past 2400 on the typical Snellen chart or what we think of as the big E. 
we try to use additional measures to really give us a better idea of exactly what level of visual impairment that a patient has because it helps us in assessing what's going to be the best strategies for um, improving that or what uh, we can do to sort of best utilize the remaining vision. The same thing with visual field testing. Um, I think it's very important to understand exactly how a patient is seeing in order to understand what can best help them. Another area that we often try to really pay attention to is contrast testing. We know that almost all conditions that affect the visual system also affect a patient's ability to see contrast. Um, so, you know, looking at different font sizes and um, what's, you know, magnification versus filters, things like that, um, that information plays a big role in that. Probably the most important part of the entire visit is the device evaluation. It's where we look at and trial different devices to see what's going to be the best, offer the best improvement for a patient. We typically try to go through several dis different distance and near devices and try to really pinpoint what's going to be the most um, helpful and efficient for a patient. We also do do an ocular health assessment. We um, want to make sure that the conditions causing visual impairment aren't changing or needing additional um, treatment or anything like that. Um, and then the final part of an exam is really the plan um, where we kind of decide where we're going to go with um, the you know, goals and the devices that we've sort of um, found throughout the exam. We typically look there at the specific you know, devices. Um, what does a patient need? And then how are we going to help them attain that? And then how are they going to need additional training on that device once it's provided? We also look at additional resources and services that are available, um, you know, things like orientation and mobility training, living skills, um, and then also an often overtime overlooked aspect of things is the um, mental health impact. Um, does a patient need further counseling or are they having trouble coming to terms with their change in vision or loss in vision, things like that. Basically for me, the bottom line is, is that it's important to understand that visual impairment affects everyday life at all levels and that low vision services are helpful and aim to attempt to offer solutions in order to maximize remaining vision and assist with visual goals. Again, we do, this is largely accomplished through the use of magnifiers and assistive technology. So I'm just going to kind of go through some of the low vision devices that we frequently prescribe. Um, we will talk through um, some of the traditional magnifiers um, before we sort of move into more digital options and some of the newer assistive technologies. So most people, when they typically think about magnifiers, they're envisioning what we call a handheld magnifier. It's a handheld portable device um, that magnifies a small area. These are helpful because they're portable. Um, they're easy to obtain. Um, they come in a large range of magnification, typically anywhere from about two times magnification to 12 times magnification. One of the most important things to remember with low vision devices is, is that the higher the magnification is in a device, the smaller that the viewing area is going to be. So for a patient that needs a higher level of magnification, these handheld devices oftentimes have some limitations in that the higher magnification significantly reduces how usable that device is because of the smaller viewing area. These devices are typically available with and without illumination, which is important to remember because for some visual conditions, um, increased lighting and illumination is very important in helping them see in others, um, increased illumination can actually be distracting and increase glare problems. One of the things that I always try to make sure that I review um, with most patients is that with a handheld magnifier, quality does matter. Um, there are lots of available devices, um, you know, easily available over the counter, um, which oftentimes will work well for low levels of magnification. But when you get higher up about three, four times magnification, it really does matter that you have the best quality optical device in place. Another sort of typical traditional magnifier that people think about is a stand magnifier. 
And this is just a magnifier that has a fixed working distance, so it sits directly on the viewing material. Most of these are illuminated, but again, you usually have the option of turning that on or off, and whether or not that illumination helps is really patient dependent. Um, these again work well with low levels of magnification. Um, the, some are available with specific filters, which can help with the clarity of the device. And then also with things like guiding lines, um, patients with macular conditions, uh, macular degeneration, and some inherited macular diseases oftentimes have a really hard time tracking along a line. And so having a guiding line available can help keep place while reading. These are just some additional examples of stand magnifiers. Um, we oftentimes with pediatric patients or um, young kids in school, we'll start with a dome magnifier because it's uh, portable, easy to use, and then doesn't, it's not super obtrusive, it's not very noticeable, it can offer low levels of magnification in an easily portable format. When we're looking at distance magnifications, typically we're looking at using some sort of a telescope. And again, I always tell patients again, near vision is usually easy. There's usually something we can do to help with reading, but with distance, it's usually a little bit trickier. Um, typically with telescopes, we're thinking of kind of a typical monocular telescope, which increases distance viewing, um, but has a very small field of view. These telescopes do great in office when patients try them, they typically really like them. Um, but because that increased magnification greatly reduces the field of vision, it does sometimes make them difficult to use in a more practical environment. There are also options for binocular telescopes as well. Um, they are oftentimes hard to fit and not as practical as some other devices. Another sort of option um, that has been newer on the market are digital telescopes. Now, these are typically, um, examples of these would be the eSight glasses and the new eyes glasses. They're typically a headset that a patient wears that has a camera on it that will project an enlarged image on a screen that sits directly in front of the eyes. Now, these are great in theory. Um, they allow highly customizable magnification. Um, usually, there's the option to control things like illumination and contrast as well. Um, there are limited limitations, though, in that they're typically not quite as portable as we would like for them to be. Um, these headsets are oftentimes heavy, bulky, and have a hard time really adjusting to different sort of focal points. Um, they're a little bit controversial in that a lot of these companies have kind of come in and, and marketed these devices as kind of miracle devices and returning sight to people, um, when in reality there are a lot of limitations. Um, I've had a lot of patients that have trialed these out and only had a very few that have actually found them to be beneficial to them, particularly kind of on a daily basis. Um, they're also very expensive, um, usually costing several thousand dollars. Um, I do think this is an area where technology potentially has the opportunity um, if we can make some further advances to make these more practical and more applicable to everyday life, um, that they could potentially be a possibility to offer a lot of improvement to patients. So digital magnifiers are what I prescribe most frequently. Um, they are typically providing the highest quality image and the most customizable um, settings to allow patients to utilize them um, most practically. They typically come in a portable digital magnifier format or a desktop format. Now, the portable digital magnifiers, um, there are several different manufacturers that make several different designs. Um, on the left up here on the screen, um, I have the um, Smart Lux by Eschenbach. And then on the right, we have the Ruby, which is made by Freedom Scientific. Um, both of these devices offer, offer similar options, 
Um, usually they just have small differences between the two that usually is patient, um, you know, dependent on which device works better. Um, but the Smart Lux is the one that I use most frequently and it offers um, five times magnification up to 12 times magnification. One of my favorite features on it is that it does allow changes in contrast. Um, so you, there's an increased contrast option. There's also the ability to change the background around. So you have black background with white writing, which for some visual conditions is significantly more comfortable to read. Um, these are great. Like I said, they're, they're very portable. They're easy to charge. They're lightweight. Um, they offer the ability um, to take a photograph of something and then bring it in closer or enlarge it if needed. Um, they have a lot of different applications and I love it when patients will come back in and tell me about new ways that they figured out how to use them. The other option, um, other than a portable digital magnifier, is a CCTV. Um, and this is sort of a desktop type setup for a digital magnifier. Usually there's a um, spot at the bottom where you can place your reading material and then it's projected onto a computer screen. Um, there are many, many different applications for this. Um, I have, you know, patients that use it for um, reading their mail, letters, um, books, lots of different applications. Um, one of the biggest challenges with this is just that because you are holding the reading material underneath the camera, it can take quite a bit of time to get adjusted to how that projects onto the computer screen. Um, so for most patients, um, it's a, quite a learning curve, but once you kind of get the hang of it, it typically is very useful to people. Another nice feature is that some of these CCTV TVs have what we call um, OCR capabilities or sort of a um, text-to-speech option. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, these devices are, um, they are relatively um, pretty expensive. Um, they're sometimes a little bit harder to obtain. Um, there's been a sort of recent change in the design of CCTVs to make them a little bit more portable. The traditional designs um, were uh, like the setup of a very large computer, um, not easily transported or moved. Um, and nowadays they're trying to make the designs to where the CCTV is easy to fold up, store, travel with, that kind of thing. Another thing that we prescribe frequently are non-optical aids. I think these get overlooked a lot. Um, people automatically jump to magnifiers and um, large devices and things like that when we're looking at different aids that might help a patient with visual impairment. And so typically with non-optical aids, I'm using filters, um, additional lighting resources, and then oftentimes we'll think about things like the OCR technology as well. I prescribe filters frequently for patients. The idea is that a filter basically filters out a specific wavelength of light that is distracting to a patient with a visual condition. We use a lot of different filters. Um, I most frequently use a plum filter or a yellow filter. Um, the idea is, is that the yellow filter, it basically filters out um, a light that's at a wavelength that um, is distracting to patients with optic nerve conditions um, like glaucoma or optic neuropathy. Plum filters typically aim to filter out wavelengths of light that are distracting to patients with retinal conditions. And I oftentimes though, I always try all filters with all patients because everybody's different. And oftentimes different ocular conditions will affect more than one structure. So it's really you know, very patient dependent on which filter works best. Um, these can either be done in a fit over, which is basically a large pair of sunglasses, uh, or not sunglasses, but a pair of glasses that goes over your typical everyday glasses. It's, um, those are nice because they can easily be removed when they're needed um, and then put back in place. You can also have actual prescription glasses, uh, lenses tinted as well. Um, most opticals offer all of the available tints um, that you can get in a fit over that you can actually have put into the lenses as well. 
Another important thing to remember is that lighting is a key factor. Um, like we talked about earlier, um, for some patients, increased lighting is really important. For others, um, it can actually be um, decreased lighting or making sure you have exactly the right type of overhead lighting that matters. Task lighting is really important. When you are reading or looking at near material, um, glare can be a significant factor. So making sure that you have the ability to move your light source and put it directly on what you're reading is really important. Um, the Ott company um, makes light bulbs and lamps that are designed to most mimic natural light. Um, these light bulbs are specifically designed to help those with visual impairment. And one of the most important thing about their lamp designs is that they are designed to be um, able to be moved and adjusted so that you can, the patient can put the lighting source directly where it needs to be on the viewing material. OCR technology is something I mentioned a second ago. Um, it's OCR stands for Optical Character Reader. Um, it's basically text-to-speech technology. Um, these are available in um, some of the CCTV options. Um, basically, it will, you highlight a section of text and it will read it out loud. Um, there are also individual devices that are themselves just devoted to this. Um, the OrCam is a specific one that a lot of people are familiar with. Okay, and then kind of moving on into some additional technology resources. Um, I think over the past several years, really, this has been uh, in general, the push about the direction that assistive technology has been moving. Um, with the, you know, sort of increase in technology, um, you know, research and um, mobile apps and things like that, it's really created quite a bit of opportunity to have an impact on the visually impaired community. Um, so I'm gonna kind of break these down into computer softwares web-based technology, and then mobile app-based technology. And then I'm also just gonna briefly touch on some changes that have come about with artificial intelligence and potential applications there. Um, I really think that some of the, in this sort of arena is really where we're gonna have the opportunity for the most future improvement. Um, I think it's gonna be really interesting to watch over the next couple of years, um, how things are gonna kind of change. So as far as computer software goes, um, it's basically broken down into two different categories. You have screen readers and then enlargement software. Screen readers are kind of exactly like it sounds. It's basically a program that's designed to assist a visually impaired person either by reading the text out loud or presenting that text in braille. Um, one of the benefits of this is that it can be adjusted to read all or part of the screen. Um, there's a lot of customization options in softwares like this. Um, some of the challenges or considerations that you kind of have to take in, into consideration as well are that these um, computer softwares, you have to look at um, the compatibility between the software and then the operating system um, that you're using. Um, there. Also, you know, what applications on the computer is it that the, the patient are that you're trying to um, access? And is a screen reader going to be the most helpful in that arena? And then are those applications and the computer software going to work well together? It can also be a further challenge um, if you're using a Braille display software, because again, there has to be compatibility between that software, the computer operating software, and then also the applications that you're trying to use as well. Um, I think that JAWS is probably the software that most pe people are most familiar with. Um, it stands for Job Access with Speech. Um, something newer could have come out that I'm not aware of, but um, another, uh, the other sort of category of computer software is enlargement software. Um, and this is pretty much exactly like it sounds. It enlarges things on a computer screen. 
one of the benefits of this, again, is the large opportunity for customization, um, you know, increasing the um, cursor on a mouse, um, the icons on a home screen, um, individual aspects in different applications, things like that. Um, Zoom text, I think, is one of the more popular versions of this. Um, I know that there is Zoom text and so several others also offer um, combination of the two. Um, so you can have um, enlargement software, which also has screen reading options um, as well. Um, again, with the considerations, you have to make sure that all of your softwares and your operating systems are going to communicate. Um, that was way past my um, technology sort of capabilities, uh, but it is an important thing to take into consideration. Um, also, with these enlargement softwares, you have to be careful as well to, um, if you're, you're increasing the size of something, you're decreasing the field of view. So you have to make sure that you're still able to efficiently navigate a screen, even with the enlargement software in place. Um, from what most feedback I've had from patients that have gone through a lot of the computer software training is, is that there's a lot of sort of time in the beginning that has to be spent on learning how to use these programs and setting up the settings so that they're most effective. Um, but generally, once you get used to it and sort of taking the time to customize it, it is something that is very helpful. So smartphone and tablet features. Um, really, we've seen a really, really large area of growth um, in these options in the past couple of years. Um, there are a wide variety of features and accessibility options out there. Um, this, these are not necessarily limited to some of the traditional um, voiceover or text-to-speech or enlargement functions that we've sort of were limited to with computer function. Um, I kind of separate these into the two categories of built-in accessibility features, which are sort of an uh, inherent accessibility things that are into the device itself um, that you can unlock or use to help access apps and things like that. Basically anything embedded to help make the device more easy for a visually impaired person to use. Um, and then the other category, more so of downloadable applications. Um, these numbers are, are probably a little bit outdated, but um, a couple of months ago, we did basically a search just to see different apps that were available for visually impaired patients. Um, we were able to come up with 138 total available apps, which is a huge number, um, especially compared to where we were just a few years ago. Um, of that breakdown, 123 of those were available for iPhones, 10 for Android, and then only five that were able to be used pretty well between both different uh, devices. That just kind of highlights the lack of sort of availability, um, you know, on the various apps. And, um, you know, I think that there are definitely benefits to each different type of device. Um, but obviously we have a lot more options than we did previously. So, and again, looking at some of these sort of smartphone apps, um, there are really are truly a lot of options out there. Um, one of the most frustrating parts of looking at this sort of technology is, is that not all of these apps are created equally. Um, and unfortunately, you really have to kind of download them play around with them, try to get adjusted to them to see if they're going to be beneficial or not. So it can involve quite a bit of time invested to try to really, A, kind of discover what all is available, but then B, also to discover what is going to be efficient or beneficial to each individual person. Another factor is, is that some of these apps are free, um, but a lot of them do involve a, a charge. Um, I've seen a wide variety of cost. Um, you know, most of these apps are, that are, um, you know, not free are six to $15 range, but I have seen some that are up, um, you know, 70, 80, $90. Um, so there are oftentimes is a little bit of an investment involved with this as well. Um, and I've had a lot of patients sort of um, report that social media continues to be a frustrating aspect of smartphone apps. 
that there's a lot of apps available for specific things and that in general there are some accessibility options that make devices easier to use but that these oftentimes don't translate to social media platforms that a lot of people use to stay connected um, you know and then just to also for you know business purposes at times and things like that so i think that that kind of continues to be a challenge um, through even with the advances that we've made um, the on the right i've got a couple of examples of a different apps um, this is just a like a very very small sampling of a few things that i personally have either used or have had patients report that they've really enjoyed using um, the KNFB reader is one of the apps that does require a purchase. It is a speech to text, um, or sorry, text to speech um, app. Uh, it functions similarly to some of the computer softwares that we talked about. Um, you know, as far as I have had reported back from patients, this one typically seems to be a little bit more accurate, easier to use than some of the free apps. Um, but again, everybody's experience is a little bit different. Be My Eyes is a, an interesting app as well. It actually uses a volunteer network to connect visually impaired patients with sighted people um, and allows them to have access to their camera to help identify or help with problems um, that arise. Um, again, I've had patients report very, very good experience with that. Um, others have not found it to be quite as helpful. Um, Seeing AI and Tap Tap C are both applications that are essentially like a talking camera. You can take a picture of something and it will identify it. Um, obviously, there are limitations with this. Um, I think a lot of people talk about various animals and things um, that oftentimes you take a picture of a dog and it'll call it a cat or vice versa. Um, in general, though, it helps give visually impaired patients a little bit more information about their surroundings and then help in identifying things that they need to, to be able to. There are some very specific applications as well. Um, there is the um, color ID, which is very helpful. You can point your camera at an object and scan it and the color ID will tell you what color that you're looking at. Um, I've heard some discrepancies in the accuracy of this. Um, and then Cash Reader is another example of a specific app that helps identify different bills and money and things like that. Um, again, several of these offer a free version and a um, pay version. Um, I think that the pay versions generally have a few more options um, than, but all worth um, checking out, I think. One of the biggest challenges that I've heard um, patients report back and then also just in discussion in the um, sort of community of low vision optometrists is, is that with all of these advances in, in technology, um, we haven't seemed to really be able to accurately apply it to orientation and mobility technology. Um, I think there's currently quite a bit of research that's being focused on this. Um, our current availability really relies on a device's ability to sort of receive or interpret pre-mapped information in an environment and then attempt to relay it to a visually impaired person, um, which creates a lot of difficulty in A, applying it to new environments, but also when new things pop up in an existing environment that the device or the technology hasn't been sort of pre-programmed to recognize. Um, it has trouble adapting, essentially. Um, you know, recently I've heard several different companies that have been putting quite a bit of research into trying to apply more um, artificial intelligence per se, or um, essentially just trying to research abilities to allow a device to um, or an application to actively be able to interpret and incorporate new information. So I'm not aware of any really great um, orientation and mobility apps that are currently available that are considered to be very accurate. There might be some out there that I'm not aware of, but um, this is something I would expect to see improvements in in the next couple of years. 
Okay, so that kind of leads us to the question of where are we headed? Where's the future of low vision and assistive technology headed? Um, I think that there are significant um, strides that are being made both in some of the traditional magnifiers and devices and then also more in the electronic digital assistive technology. Um, I know that with traditional devices, there has been a shift with the companies in trying to make devices more portable, accessible, and affordable. There's been significant changes in the ability to um, make these devices more portable, kind of like we talked about with the CCTVs, um, you know, changing the design from something that is stuck in one place to something that's light and easily packed up and, and transported. Um, also working on designs that are a little bit more ergonomic and um, unobtrusive, um, just making it easier to incorporate low vision devices into everyday life without causing a lot of disruption. Talking more about electronic devices, um, I think that, that the research and um, sort of the way that that is moving is more towards improving um, accessibility to all patients and all people. Um, and then variety, um, you know, developing apps and programs and things for different um, you know, for a variety of different um, applications and, and sort of making sure that um, every need is covered. Um, and then I think also improving the reliability of the apps and the software, computer software, and their ability to be um, incorporated and to be used um, for, you know, across different software and different operating softwares. I'm just going to kind of briefly mention this, um, you know, there um, just kind of sort of to understand part of where some of the there's been a lot of large changes and shift in accessibility for technology, um, probably in, in here in the past couple of years. Um, there is a court case actually, um, it was filed in 2016, but actively sort of started in 2018, um, there was a visually impaired patient that was unable to order a pizza using Domino's um, online ordering system because of the way that the software was set up. And basically that led to this person starting a lawsuit stating that Domino's and some of these other um, internet websites and applications were um, not following the um, ADA, um, you know, do, are not accessible to all people. The court case basically kind of started as a sort of a smaller thing, but it, the um, larger applications were basically, it raised the question of does the ADA um, apply to the internet because it was sort of put in place prior to the time when the internet was so widely used. So um, this case has not, has not been settled yet, it's still in court, but essentially it raised the question of things like privacy, uh, privacy on digital apps, um, you know, pharmacy apps, legal documents, things like that, um, you know, then it's essentially, I think, led to a large change in um, large companies trying to make their um, internet and app more accessible to patients that are visually impaired and hearing impaired as well. Um, so again, just kind of a side note, um, just kind of, I think that this is, this sort of was the initial event starting um, sort of an increase in a movement towards more accessibility, which I think is going to translate to seeing an increase in um, larger companies trying to make their technologies more accessible. Um, hopefully we'll continue to encourage research and development in some of these assistive technologies and also making them more widely available. Um, also just sort of briefly sort of touching on artificial intelligence and looking in the future of assistive technologies. Um, the real goal really is um, you know, how do we improve technology in a way to not just report um, or display visual properties in a physical environment, but to help the user also understand what is going on in front of them. 
So, you know, our current technologies are really based on either enlarging something so that it is easier for a visually impaired patient to see it or to have a device report on what the visual information is. And then the gap that's sort of right now, um, a lot of the research is focusing on crossing is how do we get these devices to take this information and apply it more into a way that is helpful for a visually impaired patient? Um, examples like walking into a crowded restaurant and not just having your device or your application report to you on what's around you, but helping that patient understand where an empty seat or a table is. Um, you know, looking at recognizing a specific individual in a crowd of people. Um, reading emotions on faces and some more, you know, dynamic situations rather than just reporting on what's directly in front of the device. Um, there's also been some discussion as well about virtual reality and how some of that technology could be applied to visually impaired patients as well. Um, you know, I haven't seen a whole lot of research or practical applications of that, um, but I think it's also something else worth paying attention to. Um, and then I think just in general on some more broader um, applications of other increases in technology, um, you know, things like autonomous vehicles, um, increasing, um, you know, access to transportation, um, you know, robots and the ability to apply that technology to um, benefit or to be um, helpful to a patient with visual impairment. Um, home automation, um, you know, things of that nature that have really, those markets have increased significantly in the past couple of years. And I think that another aspect of looking not just at the changes in the technology, but how can we take technology that already exists and apply it in a way that is beneficial and helpful for patients with visual impairment. Um, and just in closing, a um, couple of things. Um, you know, there are a lot of resources out there. Um, I have a few here listed that have just been helpful to me um, personally, um, kind of on a more local level. Um, but it's important to kind of make sure that you're aware of the resources that are there and that you're, you know, that we're helping to make sure that anybody with visual impairment also knows the resources that are out there. I find the biggest disconnect between um, patients that are sent to me from ophthalmologists and, um, you know, other medical providers that are just trying to get some help for their patients is that lack of information about the available resources and technology that's out there. Um, so, you know, for, for my purposes, um, the Blind Services Division, um, which used to be the Office for the Blind um, and the Office for Vocational Rehabilitation, um, offering services like orientation and mobility training, um, living skills, um, uh, you know, again, voc, voc rehab is really helpful as well for patients that qualify for that. Um, the Bluegrass Council for the Blind, um, which I know everyone's familiar with, but just offering additional resources, particularly being really up on available technology resources, um, you know, just for, at the very least, for patients to have the opportunity to interact with other, other people that are going through the same thing. Um, I don't know if you, anyone's familiar with the Blind Life podcast, um, but I follow um, and, you know, generally I've found that to be the most updated resource on available technology. Um, and then also the American Foundation for the Blind. Um, I feel like they have a very good, um, relatively comprehensive list of resources available as well. And just a few references. And then again, my CEU code word is salmon for anybody that missed it earlier. Um, and then any questions at all about any of the information that, that we talked about? Um, and again, that was kind of a quick overview of general things that we kind of go over and talk about in the low vision exam. Um, and then also any questions about the services that we offer at um, UK Advanced Eye Care? All right, Kristen, we do have uh, some questions in our chat box. And what the first one is, do you have a brand 
or a website that you can recommend for purchasing tinted glasses? And would you recommend talking to the doctor first before purchasing them? Okay, so I, I would in general recommend um, speaking to your eye care provider about purchasing glasses. Um, not all are created equal, um, especially if you have a certain level of visual impairment where we want to, you know, be more concerned with the type of material in the filters or glasses being um, protective. Um, I will say, though, that, that low vision services and, um, you know, providers that are familiar with this type of thing um, can sometimes be hard to access as well. Um, you know, so um, we would prefer that you have the ability to talk with your doctor about it first, but I also think that sometimes that's not necessarily reality. Um, as far as fitovers and filters go, um, I frequently, um, I use Eschenbach. Um, they are a really great resource for um, low vision devices in general. Um, I think that their uh, quality of what they do is, is really good. Um, if you're interested in having prescription um, glasses with a filter on them, then um, I would actually recommend that you use just your local um, uh, optician or wherever you purchase glasses from. Those tents usually are something that you can dip lenses in. Um, you don't necessarily have to have an entirely new pair of glasses made to access that. Is there a better filter color for vision, especially at night if the visual impairment is just age related? So for that, typically we recommend a very light yellow tint. Um, the, you want to be careful with the tint to, you want to filter out the distracting light, but you don't want the tint to be so dark that it's filtering out the light that you need to see, which is particularly relevant at night. Um, so typically I recommend like a yellow one, which will be the lightest yellow tint that you could get. All right. Um, does the eye care provider prescribe the devices or can clients purchase them? So typically, um, that depends on, on the device. Um, there are some companies that require a, um, a prescription or basically an order placed by the eye care provider. Um, there are lots of companies where you can get the devices without necessarily having a recommendation um, from your eye care provider. Um, I think that um, most companies, if you, they have really great customer service. Um, if you call and speak to a customer service representative, they typically will um, be happy to walk through with you um, what they offer and what your options are. Um, I do recommend though, um, particularly, um, especially with kids um, and um, patients that have lower levels of visual impairment that you get a actual device evaluation with a provider though, um, because you can, if you're using the wrong level of magnification, you can potentially put more strain on your eyes um, than, than you need to be. Um, it is important that you have accurate level of magnification. Another question is, can more than one device be prescribed? Absolutely. I would say that on average, we typically recommend two to three different devices. Um, I have several patients that have one device that they use for reading, one device that they use for a distance, um, one that's portable, one that stays in their home. Um, we, there's no limit on the number of devices that can be prescribed. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions that our audience has? Yes, we have another one here. Um, do you know if Medicaid pays for these devices? So Medicaid, um, typically insurance companies do not cover devices except for pediatric patients. Um, there are a few vision carriers that do offer some coverage for low vision devices, but in my experience, it's very, very difficult to get them to pay for it. Okay. Any other questions from our audience for Dr. Perry? So there's lots of great comments here. I hope you take time to scan through. Um, just uh, explaining how, how great your presentation was, how important the information. Um, 
had a wealth of information to share and uh, this is being recorded so um, people attendees and others can uh, rehear and and take notes thank you again so much for thanks so much for having me being a part of our conference thank you and i'll turn it over to christy we'll have we'll highlight another great sponsor So it's our pleasure to um, introduce Maggie Felton, and she's with Banda Pharmaceuticals, and she's going to talk today about Non24, one of their newest um, lines of medication. And I think Maggie's on, and we're catching you a little early, so I hope you're here with us. Thank you. And thank you, um, Dr. Peary. That was amazing. Um, I apologize. I have a screensaver. Let me just edit this real quick. Well, I'll just leave it. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Can everybody hear me? I can't quite tell if I'm on. You're fine. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. So um, my name is Maggie Felton. I am a clinical nurse educator, um, nurse practitioner, um, and I uh, educate on a condition called non-24. It's a circadian rhythm disorder. Um, I just want to say thank you for being here. This has been a great conference. I'm learning tons, um, so it's, it's been wonderful. Uh, thank you. Um, I have to say I'm very, very proud to work for a company, a company called Vanda. They've been wonderful, and they truly pride themselves on uh, supporting the blind and visually impaired community. They're always, always, always looking for opportunities to sponsor, support, collaborate um, through various uh, fundraising projects and so on. Um, and they work with various, various organizations, National Federation of the Blind, you know, Blind Veterans Association, Lighthouse, Cane Events, and so on and so on. So um, very, very lucky to be able to work for a company that's so supportive in terms of um, education, especially in this community. So um, I, I work for this company that uh, gave us the opportunity to work for something called Patient Outreach Program. And through this patient outreach program, nurses like myself, and there are several, several of us, um, have the opportunity to reach out to the community and provide live programs. Although now there are Zoom programs, we provide these virtual programs, essentially education on the condition non-24 um, at a very, very local level. So we reach out to all chapter groups, um, uh, uh, other small local events to connect and really give them lots of lots of empower them with support on what to do, what are the symptoms and so so forth. Um, uh, if anyone here has not heard of non24, it is a uh, sleep disorder, rather a circadian disorder that's very prevalent in those who are totally blind, up to 70% of individuals who are totally blind may be affected by it, but it's not exclusive to those who are totally blind. Um, anyone can be affected by this disorder, uh, even sighted individuals, but it's just more prevalent in those who are totally blind. And it's because it's mostly driven by uh, light perception or their lack of. And so we uh, reach out to the community, we provide this education because we have found there's still a low awareness on non-24, especially in the clinical community, um, because it is still considered a rare disorder. So we try to empower uh, individuals and give them as much knowledge and information that, that we can, so they can take that back to their providers and have proper discussions. And another reason why we talk about uh, non-24, because the symptoms mimic other sleep disorders, um, you know, very similar to sleep apnea or insomnia or anxiety insomnia, sometimes even narcolepsy and so forth. So there are lots and lots of symptoms that overlap. They're very similar to non-24. So it's very challenging and difficult 
for someone to try to differentiate one from the other. And there's really not lots of great tests out there to kind of distinguish when we're talking about sleep disorders and mental health. So a lot of times we rely on signs and symptoms. Um, those of you who may not know, uh, the non-24 uh, circadian rhythm disorder um, is a disorder where individuals uh, sleep cycle is sort of all over the place. Uh, those who have it will tell you that their sleep feels like a roller coaster. Um, it's a disorder of uh, hormonal imbalance where we produce hormones at the most inappropriate times. Um, the individuals who have men 24 will tell you that they find themselves doing all sorts of things at nighttime where they can't sleep. Um, they're very active. They're doing laundry, dry cleaning, uh, or, or, you know, empty out the dishwasher, vacuuming, all sorts of things that you would typically do during the day. Uh, lots of times it's because we're producing these uh, hormones like cortisol, it's an alert, active, awake hormone. We produce them at nighttime um, when you have non-24. And on the other side, we produce, produce excess amount of melatonin during the day where we should actually be uh, awake. And so that makes individuals very, very tired and sleepy. Um, and those who have non-24, they tell you it's, uh, it impacts their quality of life um, on a daily basis. And so um, we talk about it because um, it's still considered a rare disorder, disorder um, and we try to empower individuals um, to gain as much information that they can so they can have these proper conversations with their physicians. Um, and so um, as a uh, representative of patient outreach program, uh, anyone that you know is interested um, or has a group um, that uh, would value or gain um, uh, insight uh, from this, we encourage you to uh, connect with us and I'll put my information down. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. We'll be more than happy to provide these uh, type of educational sessions. Um, and now everything's done Zoom, although we'd love to do them in person. Hopefully we get to do them soon. Uh, but also keep in mind that, uh, you know, a company that I work for values, um, uh, values very much education uh, and support in the community. So if there are events um, or, or fundraisers or, or sponsorships, um, they're always, always, always looking to do that as well. So feel free to reach out as well. Um, and I know I only had a very, very t uh, limited time slot, so I didn't want to extend myself. I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. Uh, lots of great information here. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll take them now. But other than that, I'll put my information in a chat box and I uh, encourage anyone, if you'd like more information, feel free to reach out. Thank you so much, Maggie. Hey, everybody, um, you received their flyer um, that was provided to us by Maggie that had some additional information and her contact information. We emailed it with the link and then we, I put it in the mail to those of you that had pre-registered prior to yesterday. Those of you that are just joining us today, I'll put some of those resources from our vendors in the mail to you so that you didn't miss out on anything. Again, the goal of today's um, session has really been to share resources so that those of us working out in the field with the public, um, we're sure to encounter persons who have low vision to no vision. And we wanted to make sure that our communities had resources so that they could help um, the people that they're serving. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Diana. All right, thanks, Christy. And uh, a note from uh, Teresa Thomas that I want everyone to hear is that Bluegrass Council of the Blind has nearly all of these devices that were discussed today um, and others available for people to try, borrow, or receive. So they are based on availability, but it is uh, certainly something to, to make note of um, if you want to investigate and to reach out to the Bluegrass Council of the Blind um, about any one particular device. So thank you, Teresa, for that note. Thanks, Maggie. Maggie's uh, information is now in the chat box. So if you want to take that down, uh, and again, she has um, additional information that will be sent to you or has already been sent. 
Well, I'm going to introduce you and then we're going to uh, step back and listen intently to what you have to say. Our final symposium session is entitled Vision Lost, The Journey from Grief to Acceptance. And it will be presented by Dr. Jeffrey Jackson. An earlier agenda also listed uh, a co-speaker, Dr. Susan Amet, who was unable to be with us today. Dr. Jackson is a licensed psychologist with over 20 years of professional experience. He is currently employed by the Lexington, Kentucky Veterans Affairs Medical Center. His work focuses largely on helping veterans overcome disorders of mood and anxiety. He is a member of the visually impaired community becoming legally blind as a teenager. And we certainly do welcome you, Dr. Jackson. Thank you very much. And it is definitely an honor to be here. And I want to uh, thank those organizing the uh, symposium today for the invitation. Um, when I got the invitation, it was a real treat. And uh, I am sad that Susan wasn't able to join us today. And I certainly hope that she has a speedy recovery. Um, I know it was very kind of unexpected. So uh, definitely hoping for a speedy recovery there. All right, so the title of uh, this presentation for me today is Vision Lost, The Journey from Grief to Acceptance. And a good portion of our time today will be spent with me just kind of talking through that journey. Um, and that journey is largely based on what many of you are probably already familiar with and that uh, has to do with the stages of grief or the grieving process. Um, and that was developed primarily back in the 1970s or so by Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross uh, in her study of people who were going through end of life um, processes, you know, as they grieved the end of their life as, and, and as their loved ones grieved the loss of the individual. And, and what has happened over the years is that that model, that rubric has kind of become um, a standard uh, for other forms of loss as well. Now, what it does is largely describe a process. It doesn't do a whole lot in terms of understanding grief, but it does just kind of give us a, a model um, through which, you know, to look at, at the grieving process. And so we'll, we'll spend time talking about that today. Um, and my plan is to spend time kind of talking about, you know, the process of grieving, the stages of grieving through my own experience. Um, as mentioned, uh, I lost a high percentage of my vision as a teenager, becoming legally blind as a teenager due to um, what the doctors tell me uh, was a viral infection, um, but we'll spend more time talking about that. Now, before we jump into uh, the remainder of our discussion, um, I believe there is a word that you all may need to know for uh, your purposes of, of getting credit, and that I believe the word is sunflower. Um, is that correct, sunflower? I believe that's the correct word. And so uh, as you, sunflower seeds. Okay, I missed the seed part. Thank you very much. Okay, so by all means, please um, get that down so that uh, credit for uh, this particular workshop. Okay, so let me begin by telling you a little bit more in terms of those stages of grief. And as I mentioned, this is probably uh, something most, if not all of you are familiar with, but I'll walk through it real quickly just to kind of set the stage. So in Dr. Kubler-Ross's research back in the 70s, she observed that as people moved through the grieving or the mourning process, the first kind of stage that they encountered was this stage of of shock and denial, where some news came down that basically 
uh, had to do with the person receiving a uh, essentially what we'll call a terminal diagnosis that um, they're in the process of dying. And upon learning that, they kind of went into this state of shock, which was then rapidly followed in her observations by um, the uh, a attitude toward the news of what she called denial, basically saying, mm -mm, not me, not me. From there into stage two, as she described it, the person would move into a place of anger, being angry about the situation, feeling treated unjustly, feeling treated unfairly, and the natural emotional response to feeling uh, treated unjustly or unfairly is anger. From there, she observed that people would then often move into a stage in which they attempted to bargain a different outcome. If then is a very common uh, refrain heard by folks who are grieving a loss. Um, if, and it's largely kind of a, it's a bargaining with essentially uh, an entity I'll call God because, um, you know, it's largely a, a conversation with the divine. And so if you will do this for me, then I will do that for you. If you will spare my life, then I will devote, you know, the remainder of my life to serving some higher cause or making some other bargain. And since that bargain often, in fact, rarely, uh, and that's kind of a, sorry about that because it kind of went two different directions with that, often and rarely. Those two don't quite fit together, but, but often the bargain does not uh, come true. In fact, it rarely comes true. And from there, what Dr. Kubler-Ross observed is that people move into a state of depression. Now, this is not typically thought of as clinical depression. Clinical depression, you know, being a specific diagnosis, uh, medical diagnosis. This is this is depression, but it's a it's a state of low mood. It's a state of profound sadness. It's a state of despair, um, and it and it just occurs naturally as someone goes through a loss. Now, typically, that kind of depression eventually kind of runs its course to the point, again, that Dr. Kubler-Ross observed, of acceptance, accepting reality for what it is. This is what is actually happening to me. This is what is actually happening in my life. And that acceptance is, it's a kind of in its early stages, it's sort of a resignation, kind of a, I'm resigned to this being the way it is. Yet over time, what ends up happening is it, is it goes from resignation to this place of, okay, so I'm going, you know, in her observation, using her model, I'm going to die. So what can I do to make the most of the days, the weeks, the months that I have to live? What can I do to make the most of it? And that's, you know, at that point, then Dr. Kuba Ross kind of came to the conclusion that the person has moved through the grief, moved, you know, passed through that journey of grieving the loss to the place of accepting the new reality uh, for him or herself. So, with that in mind, let me kind of make it, for lack of a better way of putting it, let me make it experiential by kind of applying that, that process to my own story. Um, so as a teenager, I had several aspirations, but two primary aspirations. Number one, I wanted to play 
professional baseball. And number two, I wanted to become a surgeon. Now, did I have the skills to play professional baseball? Eh, doubtful. I thought I did, but probably doubtful. To pursue the path of be going to medical school and becoming a surgeon. But I still love the game of baseball. And as a teenager, I played it as often as I could. So one night, went to bed, just kind of looking forward to the next day. And at some point in the middle of the night, not exactly sure when, something changed. I woke up the next morning completely blind, totally sightless. Thought, eh, when I first opened my eyes and as I looked up, I kind of saw this gray mottled nothing. And I thought to myself, eh, maybe it's just sleep in my eyes. So I rubbed my eyes and, and, and kind of blinked a few times and looked again. Still nothing. Terrifying. And so I heard from my parents and they came rushing in and, you know, asked what's wrong and I can't see, I can't see. And immediately my mother called our eye doctor and he said, take Jeff to the emergency room right now. I'll meet you there, get him there now. So from that point, I spent the next week or so in the hospital getting poked and prodded and scanned and stuck with needles uh, and, and, and you name it as the doctors tried to figure out what was going on. Well, eventually they discovered, okay, we know what's going on, but we're not sure why it happened. They gave the condition that I had this big fancy title called bilateral retrobulbar optic neuritis. Optic neuritis is not that uncommon of a disorder. The fact that I had what was called bilateral optic neuritis, retrobulbar, which means that it was a the, the inflammation of the optic nerve, both optic nerves behind uh, a certain part of the eye was pretty rare. And so they had no idea why it happened. But ultimately they determined that it probably was caused by the common cold virus that just happened to work its into you know, my central nervous system and settle on the nerves of my eyes. And as I fought off the infection, my immune system also destroyed the lining of the nerves, which are necessary for, you know, taking an image on the retina to the back of the brain where it's processed. And so the damage was done. I was prescribed a course of steroid therapy to kind of get the inflammation down. And when the inflammation, the swelling went down, you know, things got a little better. I regained some of my sight, but it was never fully there. But, you know, I was bound and determined to keep going and doing, you know, moving into my, my future. Uh, I still wanted to play baseball and I still wanted to go to medical school. So that spring, you know, the folks at my school knew what had happened. We had shared that with them and they were aware of kind of what was happening. Uh, that spring, I went, you know, to spring training for baseball. First day I was there, coach kind of assigned us to partners to just warm up, throw catch, play catch, throw the ball. And the first thing I noticed was when my buddy would throw me the ball, I might see it one out of every six, one out of every seven throws. 
I got hit with the ball several times. It obviously went past me a lot. And I knew at that moment that my career in baseball was pretty much over. I put my glove down, I looked at the coach, and I walked away from baseball. Now, the denial piece there is pretty clear. The shock there is pretty clear. Waking up, no eyesight, total shock. But then that whole notion of denial. I can still do this. I can still play baseball. I tried. Needless to say, I couldn't. And so I put down my glove, as mentioned, and walked away. But I still was bound and determined to go to medical school. Well, if I can't play baseball, I can still become a surgeon. And so I spent the rest of my high school months, I think that was my junior or senior year, I don't recall exactly which, which is kind of funny to me that I don't recall if it was my junior or senior year. But anyway, I finished out my high school career, went to college, and I struggled through college because, you know, again, in that sense of denial, um, you know, I thought, eh, I don't need any accommodations. I don't need any adaptations to help me get through. I'm just going to do it. So I, I still made okay grades, but I struggled. It was hard. Um, and the harder it got, the angrier I got, thinking this is not fair. This is not right. And so, you know, I just became kind of this angry college student. But I kept going. I kept going. And then it got to be my senior year in college. And I took a particular class um, that required the use of a microscope. And I leaned over that microscope and I looked down into the specimen and it dawned on me, I could not see what it was I was supposed to be looking at. And I remember my professor just kind of actually holding a stylus and pointing at whatever it was I was supposed to see and I couldn't see. And the next thing you know, it's bye-bye medical school because the first two years of medical school are very, very uh, sight intensive, having to do a lot of microscopy in the field of histology, having to do uh, dissections and things of that nature. Bye-bye medical school. And so I gave up the dream of medical school at that point. Um, but in the process, you know, I, I did my fair share of bargaining. I pray a lot, God, if you will do this for me, then I will, you know, go on mission trips and I will do a lot of other things. Uh, obviously, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. And depression set in. My two dreams, no surgery. I mean, after all, who want a guy that can't see very well cutting on him, right? And so no medical school, no surgery. So I finished college and just kind of dropped out of life for a little bit. Um, worked some odd jobs, lived back home at my parents' house and tried to figure out now that my dreams have been shattered and I have, you know, really no vision of the future, what am I going to do from here? And that kind of hopelessness, that kind of despair and discouragement just sent me deep depression. Um, but then one day, Somebody, I don't remember exactly how it happened, but somebody, I decided to take a, uh, you know, while I'm working these odd jobs, I decided to take a, um, a class in 
counseling at the local university. And so I took the class and it's like, yeah, this is kind of cool. And it's not, you know, it's not really what I had planned on doing, but and it's not really kind of what I'm going to do with the rest of my life, but it's, it's just kind of cool, kind of interesting to think about this counseling stuff. Somewhere in that same kind of time frame, I'm at the wedding of a friend of mine who also happened to be a student of my father. So my father and I, I and one of my professors from college was there because he had uh, been a mentor to, to the uh, groom. And he looked at me and goes, so Jeff, have you decided what you're going to do with your life at this point? And I said, no, I haven't. I'm, I'm just absolutely lost. And he nodded on, you know, with him, you know, compassion and understanding. And he said, have you ever considered clinical psychology? Now, my father is a clinical psychologist. I knew what he did. I highly respected what he did. And, you know, I love my father deeply. And I'd taken that counseling class, so I kind of knew a little bit more about what he did. But that's not what was, you know, in the cards for me. Or so I thought. The seeds were planted. Well, he said, you know, you really ought to think about clinical psychology. You have a way with people. You have a way of just listening to people and kind of thinking through things. You might want to consider that. Well, afterwards, you know, time went on and the seed is planted and it started to develop. But at the same time, I also kind of experienced um, what some people call a, uh, a call to ministry, a call to religious service. And I wound up coming down here to Kentucky to attend the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary over in Louisville. And um, while I was there, I kind of went through all the stages of grief all over again. You know, the denial, the anger, the bargaining, the depression, and then eventually the acceptance. But in that whole process, I became very clear in my mind that I was going to do something of service to others. Now, I developed while I was at the seminary a strong interest in a field called systematic theology, all the time still focusing on counseling and helping others through pastoral care. But his interest in clinical psychology had grown throughout the whole process, too. And I remember, again, it's interesting, it always seemed to happen my last year of school. My last, my, you know, my last year of, of high school, you know, my last year of college deciding, you know, no medical school. And then my last year at the seminary, I was sitting out on the campus. One of my professors walked by, Dr. Smothers, and he, he said, well, Jeff, you're going to be graduating soon. And um, what do you think? And I said, Dr. Smothers, I've been kind of accepted into two different programs of looking at a doctoral program in systematic theology, and I'm looking at a doctoral program in clinical psychology, and I'm just not sure which way I'm going to go. And he said, after, you know, kind of thinking for a moment, he just looked at me, and this would have been a beautiful intervention for any, any helper. He stopped, he looked at me, he goes, well, it sounds like you're trying to decide whether you're going to spend life up in the ivory tower or down in the trenches. And when he framed it that way, I knew exactly where I was going to spend the rest of my life. And I decided to pursue the doctorate in clinical psychology. Now, with all of that in mind, I was also aware this is going to be really hard because at that point I had accepted the fact, begrudgingly, mind you, I had accepted the fact that I had visual impairment, that I had significant visual loss, and that in order to complete a doctorate in clinical psychology, I was going to need some help. 
So I went to the folks at the university from which I got my doctorate. I, I went into the um, folks who handle the accommodations and I said, look, here's the thing. I need help. And they helped me. And the more they helped me, the more I learned to live life with low vision. I learned skills. I learned um, to, you know, how to be a student with low vision. I had not yet learned that at that point, but I had learned to be then to be a student with low vision. And ultimately I graduated, you know, very high in my class in the uh, doctoral program. And I subsequently spent the remainder of my career as a clinical psychologist. Now, Throughout that process, I have moved forward and backwards and moved forward and backwards through those various stages until eventually I did get to the point of not only accepting that I am a person with low vision, a person with you know pretty serious visual impairment, but embracing that as part of my identity, not my whole identity, but part of my identity. And someone even asked me recently, you know, if you had the opportunity to regain your sight fully, would you do that? My first reaction was no. I wouldn't. I have lived life longer as a person with visual impairment than I did as a fully sighted individual. And I have learned to embrace life as a person with visual impairment. And I'm not sure that going back, if I had that opportunity, would be what I really would want to do. You know, I've accepted this is how my life is and not just accept it, but embrace that. And that's largely my journey through grieving to acceptance. You know, beginning in my teenage years with the loss of my eyesight and even today, you know, still embracing having accepted my, the reality of life for me as one, an individual with visual impairment, but embracing that, you know, embracing that and, and living life that way and, and, and finding the joy of life and the humor in life. Um, but it takes work, it takes time. And, and the things that made a difference for me, and I will be very clear about this, it was recognizing that in order to make that journey through the grieving process, I had to let others help me. I had to accept their assistance. Because if I had attempted to do it on my own, it would have never happened. I would still probably be that really angry teenager turned into, you know, adult. Um, or in this constant state of, you know, low-grade depression or something like that. But because somewhere along the line, I decided that the thing to do was to accept the help of others, I was able to move through that process. So that's an important piece of the journey. And that is, number one, accepting help from others. Another important piece of the journey is, and you all may have noticed this, I didn't make this really clear, but you all may have noticed this, that another important part of the journey is recognizing that, at least in my journey, I didn't move through each stage one after the other sequentially. I kind of flowed in and out, back and forth between the stages, getting to a point of acceptance at one place in life and then change, kind of having to go through the whole process all over again. Sometimes it felt like I was right back at square one. I wasn't back at square one because I had already kind of learned some skills and had already 
accepted and embraced some of uh, the difficulties that I was dealing with. But I kind of moved in and out of those stages. And when you look at the research, that's precisely what happens for most people. Most people kind of move in and out of the stages as they grieve a loss. And sometimes they spend longer stretches of time in one stage and shorter stretches in others. Um, and sometimes they kind of move through the whole process a number of times as they move through life. You know, changes, events, um, what we call role transitions, moving from one place in life to another, which is very stressful, often triggers that whole process of loss and grieving again. And so the idea is only just because I get to acceptance at one place in my life doesn't mean I'm going to be there all the time. I remember when I first decided to uh, use a cane. For the longest time, I absolutely refused to use a cane. And I don't know how many doors I walked into. I don't know how many curbs I stepped off of. I don't know how many cracks I tripped over. But I was bound and determined to life without a cane. At some point, though, and I don't remember specifically why, I do know that people urged me often to get a cane and learn to use a cane. But eventually I decided, okay, you know what, if for no other reason than to just get people off my back. I got a little bit of an oppositional streak. But just to get people off my back, I would get a cane. I learned to use it. Now, I really don't go anywhere without it. I don't always use it. When I'm in a place that I know well, I'll walk around the building without it. But typically, whether I'm at the store with my wife or uh, going through a different part of our VA hospital here or something like that, I've got my cane and it is leading the way. And so there's my timer going off and let me know right on time. And so it's the idea that whenever we move through a different transition, a, a place of change in our lives, there's a good chance that be it related to vision loss or to some other form of loss. We're going to experience, experience those stages or those feelings that we experience in the change, you know, in the, um, in the state of grief, the grieving process. And with that, let me open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Yes. And we'll be looking at the oh, chat well. here and take any questions that our audience might have. You have taken- Yeah, and somebody would read, yeah, if somebody would read the chat box for me. I, I use JAWS and it's kind of tough for me to navigate, uh, especially because I'm not real familiar with Zoom. And so uh, if somebody could point out those chat questions for me, that'd be great. Okay, we'll do. We'll do. Um, can you can you discuss how the grieving process works with people with progressive vision loss? Uh huh. Yes, and that is one of the more common questions with the progressive piece, and that is because it is a ongoing change. Progressive vision loss. It will be this this experience of repeatedly kind of going through the cycles. Uh, typically people who are experiencing progressive vision loss, they'll, not always, but often they'll get to a place where they'll stay kind of stable. Their eyesight will stay stable for a while. And, uh, you know, they'll kind of get comfortable and embrace that. And then there's another change, you know, another diminution in their eyesight and things get worse again and they go through 
the grieving process. And so it is, it is this experience of repeatedly kind of going through the grief um, and, and kind of learning to accept that, okay, this is kind of how it's going to be until eventually, you know, my eyesight gets to the place where it has kind of reached the end of, of its change, um, either to the point where, you know, one has lost all sight or to the point where the progression stops. Um, it, it's very painful in the sense that going, knowing that this is not it, knowing that maybe I've reached a, a you know, a, a, a point of stability, kind of a plateau, if you will, maybe, and then knowing, well, chances are good that there's going to be additional loss. Um, an analog is the idea of aging. As we get older, you know, we know through time that uh, we're not going to be as strong. We're not going to be as fast. We're not going to be able to do the things we once did. And that's, if we sit back and we, and we really focus on that, that becomes very overwhelming. That becomes very um, discouraging. But as we kind of recognize, okay, this is, a, this is what's going to happen. This is reality. Then as I deal with the reality, I'm much more able to really appreciate and enjoy the now, the present, the moment recognizing it's not always going to be this way, but while it is this way, I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to make the most of it. That's that notion of embracing the loss, embracing these changes that are going to come down, embracing reality, and then making most of what's there. Now that said, with progressive vision loss, you know, I'm, I'm kind of looking at the end of the, of the story there. There's a lot of pain in the middle of the story, recognizing that, you know, one's eyesight is going to continue to dim and one's eyesight is going to continue to diminish. And there's pain in that, there's pain in that. And I think it's important to honor that pain and to grieve, you know, as you go through it. I hope that answers the question. I, I, I think so. I think you did very well. Um, do you do you ever get offended when someone calls it a stick rather than a cane? <laughs> one of our one of our um, one of our staff uh, did that the other day. Um, well, this has been a few months ago. I accidentally left uh, my cane in the um, in the staff room and. Uh, he brought it to my office and he said, here's your stick. And I, I, I kind of laughed a little bit and I said, thank you, you know. And one thing I kind of have to keep in mind or what I encourage in those cases, and certainly for me is, is, you know, to keep a sense of humor about it. And then to remember, you know, when people describe things a certain way, they're largely coming at it from a, a place of ignorance. And I don't mean ignorance in a negative way here. I mean, they just don't know. They don't know maybe what to call it any, any more than I might, you know, call, um, you know, we have, we have some folks here who use walkers, rolling walkers. Um, and, you know, somebody might refer to that as uh, the person's stroller. And that's simply because, you know, maybe I don't have the language. I don't know the language. All right. And so kind of with it a little bit and laugh with it a little bit and, and just keep in mind, chances are this person's coming at it from a place of ignorance, of just not knowing. What helped you the most in accepting your vision loss? What helps me most in accepting my vision 
loss. I'm going to say first and foremost time because it did not happen. You know, I lost my eyesight overnight, but accepting the vision loss was a years long process. Okay. It did not happen, you know, in the literal blink of an eye. So recognizing for me, it, it took, it took time and I look back on it and that was probably the number one thing was, um, recognizing the time that it took. Now, I also think back, you know, I mentioned having an oppositional streak. And when I look back, I think I had to prove to myself, I had to prove to myself that I can do this or I can't. And so I had to do a lot of personal experience experiments. And I use the cane as an example of that. You know, so many people tell Jeff, you ought to do this. You should do this. You should get a cane. You should, you should learn to use a cane. You should do this. And finally, like I said, just that opposition, that oppositional streak just kind of, it, it, it motivated me to I'll do this, just get people off my back. And then I did it. And in the process of doing, you know, A, is this going to get people off my back? B, it taught me, hey, this actually makes life easier. So I think that's another piece of it is, you know, listening to others, but myself and, and learning for myself what I could and could not do and what I needed. What I needed for myself and what I needed from others. Okay. What can we do to support our clients as they are losing their vision? Mm-hmm listen. As they talk about the loss, listen. Be present with them. Um, one of the things that as helpers, we are, we, we, we have this thing called the writing reflex, R-I-D-H-T-I-N-G, the writing reflex. And those of you who have been trained in motivational interviewing will recognize that concept very quickly. But it essentially is this notion that, you know, when someone presents a problem to us, our first reflex or our first impulse is try to fix it. Try to fix it, try to make them feel better, try to find ways to, um, you know, fix whatever is causing their distress. First and foremost, take the time to listen and listen with empathy. And what I mean by empathy is to listen to really understand what it is they are experiencing, what they're feeling, what the thoughts are that are going through their mind and, you know, offer them the support and the validation of their feelings and their, um, their thoughts. And from there, begin to kind of work through the process of grieving those losses. Yeah, with listening and start with listening empathically. And so that was in uh, relation to clients. Would, would, the, would the same thing apply to the family support? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, I will say this. Uh, my mother, even to this day, still somehow finds a way to blame herself for my vision loss. Um, you know, she, she, I, I will still frequently hear her say, you know, if I had just done something differently, then maybe there was a ski trip I went on when I was in, you know, high school prior to my vision loss. Um, and she is absolutely convinced that on that ski trip is where I picked up the virus that ultimately caused, uh, the infection. Um, but I, I still hear her from time, if, if I hadn't let you go on that ski trip, then, you know, you wouldn't, this would have never happened. The family needs as much support as the patient, the client. Um, it's a different kind of support. You know, the, the client, you know, is the person who's bearing the symptom, but the family is affected by it too. And they need people uh, to take time to listen to them as well, because they're grieving 
the loss too. They're going through a transition themselves. You know, it, it's one thing, you know, they're going through this process of having a loved one who was sighted to a loved one who is losing his or her sight. Life is going to change and they recognize that. And, and, and they're grieving the loss of the life that they had kind of expected to the life that they're now going to encounter. So yeah, they need to, they need uh, someone to listen and to listen empathically to. Okay, I think we have a final question here. Um, how can we encourage our psychologists to see and work with our consumers? A lot of a lot are unfamiliar in dealing with individuals with disabilities and are dismissive or feel that they can just get over it. Yeah. <laughs> and that is, um, that is, I think, kind of pointing to that notion of the writing reflex. Um, or conversely, some folks that are um, kind of misattuned to kind of what's going on. And, and one of the things that I would encourage is, and in the, with the folks with whom I work, one of my mantras is, there is no better advocate than you. And so I encourage people to advocate for themselves. And if, if there is someone who is kind of missing the point, um, I'd encourage a person to advocate on behalf of clients for those professionals who don't see get it or, you know, take time to, to educate. You know, we often talk about cultural diversity. We often talk about cultural awareness. And obviously, you know, people with vision impairment, you know, are, are people who kind of have a different culture because we approach life a different way. We approach the world in different ways from people who are in the fully sighted community. Um, and sometimes we have to take the opportunity to teach the other people about what it's like, about what it's like to live life with low vision or no vision um, and, and to do our best to communicate to them. Now that's not easy, that's not easy because you know, when we go in to see someone for help, we want them to understand. We want them to understand. But we've also got to work from that perspective of, like, the man that brought my, uh, quote, unquote, stick to me, my cane to me that day. Um, it's working from that perspective of that frame of, they just don't get it. They don't understand. They don't, they're working from a place of ignorance. And if they're working from that place of ignorance, I can share with them the information and let them know, you know, when you say this, when you do this, I, you know, whatever emotion, I get angry, I get sad, um, I feel hurt, um, I get upset, I get frustrated because, you know, it seems to me you don't understand, you're not getting it. Let me help you get it. Let me help you understand. Now, that's psychologist speak, and you know, that's, that's the way to do it. But it's the idea of the only thing that we can really give another person is information. And when people kind of come at it from the perspective that you described, just get over it, um, or, you know, not real empathic, the only real information that we can give that person is basically I'm, I'm really not happy with the way you're handling this and something needs to change. And that's me advocating for myself. Okay. And I think that's kind of the, the critical piece is, is advocate, advocate, advocate. All right. Well, um, I'm just going to share just a few of the comments. Um, I, I, I think it oh. will. I think it will summarize what your audience have, has thought of your presentation today. Uh, I can certainly relate to many of your feelings and experiences. Thank you for such a compelling story. 
Thank you for sharing your personal experiences. I admire you for still trying baseball in medical school and not giving up on them until you try. Awesome presentation. Uh, thank you for sharing your wisdom. This just goes on and on. Your story is inspirational as well as educational and informative. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Dr. Johnson, or Johnson it, it says you are wonderful. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. So the list just goes on and on. And uh, on behalf of, of the uh, symposium, we truly do thank you for your time, uh, for your story, and for your inspiration. Well, you all are very welcome, and thank you for the kind words. If, if my wife were here, she would be telling you all to shush. You know, my head doesn't need to get any bigger, but thank you very much for the kind words, and it has been my pleasure, and uh, I want to thank you all for allowing me to be this symposium. Day first for me uh, to be uh, here in attendance with this symposium, and uh, hopefully maybe not the last. Oh, absolutely. And you were wonderful. So thanks. And we will Thank you. We'll invite you back anytime. All right. I appreciate that. You all take care. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, this has been a great day. Alert the show or hide me to control. Alert the show or hide me to Let Dr. Jack, John, we'll let Dr. Jackson log off. So we have completed all sessions of the 2020 Eye Opening Symposium. And on behalf of the EOS committee, I want to thank all of our speakers for donating their time and their expertise. Their presentations shared and updated research therapy and technology and offered this audience an optimistic outlook. In addition, practical and essential guide techniques and vision loss coping strategies enlightened and they informed. A special note of appreciation to our gold sponsors, United Healthcare and Non24 and silver sponsor Kentucky Association for Education and Rehabilitation KAER. Thanks to the numerous vendors for sharing their services and resources as well. Thank you to the EOS Planning Committee for their commitment. And finally, thanks to Suzanne Smith for overseeing our virtual symposium today. Everyone that attended will receive an email containing an online evaluation. We will hopefully get you the um, link to today's session as well. We thank you in advance for completing the evaluation as it will validate the need for the next symposium, as well as provide insight for planning it. And it is our expectation to gather in person in 2022. And with that, Diana Doggett is switching over to Christy Stamball to sign us off. Gosh, I really wish we were there in person so we could give a standing O to Diana and her team. If you know how to clap or do a high five in the comments, that would be really fun for us all. Just a reminder on the CEUs, don't forget if you needed social work CEUs, ACVREP, or CRC for rehab counselors, don't forget to complete those forms that were sent to you with the first email. Um, document the five words that you heard during the presentations and then we will be sending you the certificate. If you have any questions, again, you can always call the Extension Office. They have been just a terrific partner through this all um, and all of the committee putting this thing together and getting together. But I have to shout out not only to Diana and her team, but actually Kenny Williams brailed with the help of the Bluegrass Council of the Blind. He brailed about eight copies because people who were going to be with us in person would have liked to have that information. So that information got mailed out to people. Um, that took him a lot of time and expertise. I keep saying that braille is certainly a second language. 
and um, to everybody for spending the day with us and spending your time. And we hope that you found this to be a very beneficial seminar and give us feedback, fill out the evaluation. That's what we use to improve on it from year to year. Our sponsors make this thing happen, that it can happen for you for free and helps to offset the cost of mailing and the, the CEU certificates and the applications and things like that. So if nobody has any questions and I don't see any coming through the chat, we will sign off for today. Again, crazy shout out to the committee. That would be, I'm gonna to try to name everybody, Mary Smith with VIPS, Jennifer Rourke with the Blind Services, uh, Teresa Thomas with Bluegrass Council of the Blind. Laura Dake is with us um, virtually and she was with Bluegrass Care Navigators. Melinda from the VA really secured Jeffrey as a speaker for us and that was amazing. Harley Cannon, one of our community volunteers. Kenny Williams, another of our community volunteers. And oh, if I forgot somebody, I so, so apologize. That's why we don't name these names. Um, if you missed one of the passwords or the code words, um, you can email me, kstambaugh, S-T-A-M-B-A-U, at lexingtonky.gov. And if you can give me all but one of them, I can try to help you out. Um, again, it's really, really important that you guys were with us for the entirety of the day. And it's kind of hard to sign off on such an amazing day virtually, but we'll sign off now. Committee members, if you'll stay on with us for a little bit, we can just do a little bit of wrap up. Everybody have a great day. Stay safe.